Good evening, everyone. Sego ani buju endio wachea kwekwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So we were just meeting in committee the whole closed meeting. Uh, we discussed a couple of items, one with respect to affordable housing uh, and another with respect to an organizational update. So I will ask for a motion to rise without reporting, please. Moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Hassan, that Council rise from the committee of the whole closed meeting without reporting. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, and that's carried. Okay, next we'll move to the approval of the adeds. We have uh, a number of delegations. Um, we have a motion of congratulations. We have an item of miscellaneous business. We have some number of communications. Um, Councillor Tozo, you would like to separate out item two on the adeds, so we will do two uh, separate votes. Uh, so first, a vote on delegation number two. Uh, all those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we need a mover and a seconder for the adeds as a whole. Thank you. Sorry, I missed that. Can I have a mover or a seconder for the adeds? Moved by Councillor Sanek, seconded by for the adeds, seconded by Councillor Ridge. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now with the delegations, again, we've just separated in two votes. So first, um, we'll just do a vote to add delegation number two. All those in favor? Sorry, uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Okay, and uh, that loses um, Mayor Patterson, Councillor Osterhoff, uh, Councillor McLaren um, in the minority. Okay, so now we will do a vote then on the remainder of the delegations and all other items on the adeds. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Uh, and that's carried. Okay, uh, so with that, uh, moving on, are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Uh, Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. I, Ryan Bohm, of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of Clause 1, Report Number 34. As an employee of Utilities Kingston, it may be perceived that I have a conflict with Report 34, Clause 1, and associated clauses and bylaws insofar as it relates to Utilities Kingston's budget. I, Ryan Bowman, the corporate of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of Clause 2, Report Number 31. As an employee of Utilities Kingston, it may be received out of a conflict with Report 31, Clause 2, insofar as it relates to Utilities Kingston, and they've been submitted to the Kirk. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you, I, Brendan Tozo, of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuni pecuniary interest. Uh, in the matter of motion three, as I have an accessible parking pass for a child and or dependent. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other declarations of pecuniary interest? Okay, uh, so with that, then we will move, we have no presentations this evening, so we will move to delegations. Uh, our first delegation uh, is Colonel Sonny Hatton, Base Commander at CFB Kingston, who will appear before Council to speak to Clause 2 of Report Number 32 received from the CAO with respect to CFB Dome and Aquatics Partnership. Uh, just a note to all of our delegations this evening that you have up to five minutes to speak, and then we will open up the floor to uh, questions from members of Council. Uh, Colonel Hatton, welcome to Council, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Your Worship. Members of Council, I will not take five minutes. You'll be happy. I'll give you some time back. So it, I'm just here to address you as a, as a preamble, if you will, to Report 2, Clause 2, uh, put forth by your Chief Administrative Officer, Lenny Hurdle. So obviously, Kingston is undergoing unprecedented growth, uh, as is CFP Kingston in some respects. We are outgrowing our infrastructure in many aspects. Uh, and recreational facilities are something that I, I think everybody in the community, so whether you're a parent, you're a mother, you're a father, um, you've got kids, you've got, you yourself might want to get out to the gym. So the military has that ability through the Kingston Military Community Sports Centre, uh, but there is excess space available in our facility. And so aware that there is a need in the community, um, especially with the dome that went down on the west end of Kingston, we've received a number of requests for use of our dome. 
Um, Lenny Hurdle herself has asked if there is space available in the swimming pool because pools are at a premium. Uh, and then as well, we've got the ice, ice rink and a number of other facilities that I think we could probably be a better community partner in sharing. And so uh, the proposal that you'll hear later uh, in the council meeting, is that the right term, um, will put forth that we enter into discussion a proposal for a provision of service uh, so that we can facilitate the sharing of that facility. Quite frankly, for the military, when someone comes to us and says they want to, whether it's an hour or it's, it's a, a weekend, it is a two to three week process to get somebody to sign on the dotted line. It's a contract and it's very burdensome. And I just quite frankly don't have the staff and the time to do that for all of the users that could benefit from that space. So we're talking about dead space, if you will, for us. So most of it is evenings or weekends, less the hockey rink, because that's prime time for the hockey rink. Um, our availability, oddly enough, for the hockey rink is mostly during the days or uh, when the military community is not using it during uh, spring break, Christmas holidays, these sorts of things. And so um, in discussions with the city, uh, we think there's an opportunity here to partner, to work together so that we can better share our space to the benefit of the community. Because it not only benefits the community, it also benefits all of our military members and their families who either coach on community sports teams or have kids in these teams or these sports. And so I think it's a, a great initiative. I think it's worth exploring. And uh, I look forward to, to hearing the debate. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Uh, Councillor Bohm, I see your hand. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Your Worship, and through you, uh, thank you, thank you, Cur Colonel Hatton, there for your, your presentation. I, I think this is a, a great initiative, and uh, I know we've chatted before. Um, I guess my one question would be, um, you know, in the past we've we've tried. I know personally, I have, and Commissioner, or sorry, CAO Hurdle as well, um, with with other base commanders to to sort of get something like this off the ground. So, is this something where has there been an opening to this idea? sort of at a higher military level as well? Is this something that kind of we can build on this relationship going forward as the base, uh, as CFB Kingston basically grows its resources? Like, do we have a, a good partnership ability here going forward as well, do you believe? Uh, I hope so. I, I certainly, uh, we've, we're in discussions with the city on a number of other initiatives, including land, including housing, uh, and you name it. And so I, I think this is a great first step it shows that we're willing to work together and cooperate, and I think that uh, it's just the beginning, quite frankly. Um, to your question whether or not there's support at hire, uh, I can tell you that uh, there is similar arrangements in other cities. So especially smaller communities, you won't find this necessarily in Ottawa, or, or but in places like Cold Lake or Goose Bay, uh, they have such sharing arrangements because the communities are small. The military lives in the community. And so there's great benefit to these sorts of arrangements. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, we've always had a great relationship with CFB Kingston. So the, the more of these that we can do going forward, I think that would benefit residents and everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Councillor Sun. Thank you, Your Worship. And through you, uh, it's not a question. It's most... Uh, um, uh, the comments for so, this. Quick questions, questions only, Councillor Son. Sorry, I okay. have to be consistent. So, I'll, I'll do, that's okay. Then. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any any other questions at this point? Okay, uh, Colonel Hatton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, with that, we'll move to our next delegation on the agenda. So, that would be uh, John Jantinen, who will appear before Council to speak to Information Report Number Six regarding the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan background and status update. Uh, thank you, Honorable Mayor and uh, Council people. Um, I'm a resident of Skeleton Park uh, neighborhood and a novelist, uh, frontline uh, healthcare provider, um, community engagement specialist. Uh, I'm here as uh, a member of the Cataraki Union of Tenants, though. Um, in regards to the work that we do on a daily basis, uh, to provide essential needs to uh, some of the most vulnerable people in this community who aren't being, being provided these uh, essential needs by the city, unfortunately. I um, just want to bring up a matter, and I... This is the email I received upon uh, acceptance of my delegation, my status as a delegate. 
Please note that during your delegation, your comments are to be related to the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan background and status update. Items referenced in your application, such as potential encampment evictions or the integrated care hub, are not in order as they are not referenced in the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan background and status update report and are not matters that are on the agenda for this meeting. I just want to comment that the integrated care hub is referenced eight times in that uh, plan. So that's what I'm here to speak about tonight. And I'm here to speak from my personal experience being involved as a volunteer at the hub on, on, uh, as part of the Cataract Reunion of Tenants, as I say. So to the second point of that, not being allowed to talk about the evictions, in the in your CSW plan, the first guiding principle is everyone has their needs met. Now, the number one need that we're talking about here is shelter, and these needs are not obviously being met, and contrary to a lot of statements that are being made by, by uh, some of the politicians here, there are not enough low barrier shelter beds. This is something that's a reality. This is something that everybody seems to understand, except for certain individuals who keep making statements to the effect that there are enough shelter beds, low barrier shelter beds. It is not true. Talk to anyone down at the hub. They don't exist, okay? So if we're talking about essential needs being met, the hub right now is providing the essential need of shelter and safety for people. Evicting them from there is contrary to the, the spirit and the letter of this community safety and uh, well-being plan. So the vision statement for this plan is build a resilient community that can respond and adapt to change in ways that foster cooperation, build capacity, increase connectedness, and ensure essential needs are met. Reading this report and knowing what I know, living in the neighborhood I do, volunteering down at the hub, this sounds Orwellian to me, and it sounds like this plan is being used to provide a screen for the people sitting in this chamber right here to pretend they're doing something while behind the scenes they're doing the opposite of what this plan is intended to achieve. Okay, I mean, I'm deeply concerned about that. I mean, I hope some people here are deeply concerned about that too. So, there are four pillars of this vision. Increased connectedness uh, is the first one. So support and encourage engagement to include those with lived experience in both planning and implementation of programs and services. Okay, that's what, that's what the, the Cataract Union of Tenants does, okay? We're down there, as they say, every day providing necessary service. We, I was at a barbecue today. We're feeding people down there. I've personally rented a U-Haul truck, delivered three loads of firewood down there at my own personal expense because they didn't have any left and it was like minus 30 on March, you know, on March 2nd. When, I, when we were, you know, when we was doing that. So, you know, we were not consulted. There is nobody from the Cataract Union of Tenants sitting on a committee. There's nobody who's involved in this process. You have not approached us. You have not, so I haven't shown any interest. And apparently when we speak in council, we're not asked questions and we're basically ignored. So I'm just curious as to why that might be for number one. So pillar number two, foster collaboration. Coordinate specific issues so specific issue working groups and committees with cross-sector representation to respond to critical gaps in planning and community support. Once again, the Cataraki Union of Tenants is providing those services that, that, that address the critical gaps in planning and community support. We are the ones who are down there as community members, as volunteers, cooking food. And we do this like two or three times a week, the members of our, of our organization do. 30, delivering firewood. 30 seconds. 30 seconds, all right. So... So pillar number two also stipulates you identify opportunities for organizations to enhance collaboration and backbone support. We pay for everything we do out of our pocket and for a, from a patchwork of fundraising, all right? So I'm asking you, this is my, as my final question, I'm asking you to please engage with the Cataract Reunion of Tenants. We are the ones out there every day. We have the lived experience. We need to be represented on, you know, as this plan moves towards implementation. Okay. Thank you. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Are there any questions from council? Okay. Uh, seeing none, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. No okay. Uh, with that, we'll move to our next delegation. Um, so uh, this is moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor McLaren. 
that uh, the clauses of our procedure by lobby waive to allow Robert McInnes to appear before council to speak to clause two of report number 31. Uh, received from the CAO with respect to the update on excess soil management strategies. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, we'll do the other motions to add delegations right now as well. So number, uh, the next is moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that the clauses of our procedural bylaw be waived to allow Marina Sorensen to, uh, to speak to Council, also with respect to Clause 2 of Report Number 31. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, next, moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that the clauses of our procedural bylaw be waived to allow Abby Christie to appear before Council to speak to Clause 4 of Report Number 32. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, and then finally, moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that the clauses of our procedural bylaw be waived to allow Crystal Wilson to appear before Council also to speak to Clause 4 of Report Number 32. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, so uh, with that, we will now then move to our next delegation and we will invite Robert McInnes to come and speak to council again. This is report to clause two of report number 31 from the CAO. Mr. McInnes, welcome, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor, members of council, and the staff, and the citizens here tonight. The reason I'm here is because uh, there's a proposal to clear cut a woodland on lot 446. And on the picture up here, we can see lot 446. It's the one that's outlined in white. It's opposite uh, the milk factory. And to the right, you can see a whole bunch of treed area. That's all going. There's not to be any of those trees left. The only bit of tree that's going to be left after the uh, development has taken place is that little piece, which is 446. Now, so, I'm a member of No Clear Cuts Kingston. I'm also a member of Little Forest Kingston. And I'm a consultant in the Kingston Neighborhood Tree Planting Program. Every year I plant a whole lot of trees. But these trees are small and cannot compensate for all the mature trees we remove from the city canopy every year. A single average living tree supports about 2.3 million species. Birds, mammals, insects, reptiles, plants, kit, uh, lichen, and algae. According to the National Science Foundation, trees provide us with oxygen, flood control, air pollution reduction, carbon storage, and delight. This week, the city itself is proposing to cut down 154 mature trees and what is referred to as lot 446. This clear cut will be one of at least 20 past and present proposed clear cuts of mature trees that's happened in recent years in Kingston. Kingston has been warned by the Intact Center on Climate Adap Ad Ad Adaptation at the University of Waterloo, that this is a potential heat zone. Our city is a potential heat zone as temperatures increase due to climate emergency. The center recommended trees to help us lessen this impact. The city's attitude and policies regarding private and public trees have to change. We understand the city is going to use lot 446 to lay excess soil as permanent fill, in part because the province has new legislation requiring soil from local projects to be kept in the city. Great law. Lot 446, owned by the city of Kingston, is in the Cataraqui Business Park and is for sale. The city wants to use the fill to flatten the steep gradient on the site and to make a more buildable and marketable project. City staff, sorry. If council votes tonight to go ahead with the clear cutting of lot 446, clear cutting will start immediately. Realize this is a difficult decision. However, 
What was considered acceptable 10 years ago when the majority of council voted to create Cataract Way Business Park on the woodland area, <coughs> which includes Lot 446, is no longer acceptable. We face a dangerous expanding climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis. Everything must be done to protect nature, our ally. During its last meeting, Council voted to acknowledge the concept of shovel-worthy, as opposed to simply shovel-ready in the East End. We believe the same concept must apply throughout the city, including Lot 446. This is a significant woodland owned by the city, which has the right to say, the city, which has the right to say, no to its destruction, unlike in privately owned properties. How will the City Council be able to say no to any tree removal requested by a developer after destroying this urban woodland? 30 seconds. Thank you. We suggest that all members of Council should visit the site before making a decision about its future. We are asking Council to direct City staff to continue their search for an appropriate dumping site. We also support the city's plan to review and modernize the present tree bylaw later this year. We rely on city council to protect our canopy, our environment, and our quality of life. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I think we'll, we'll just thank pause you. there. Are there any questions from members of council? Okay. Mr. McInnes, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move to our next delegation. Uh, we will invite uh, Morenis Sorensen to speak to Council, also with respect to Clause 2, Report Number 31 from the CAO, with respect to the update on excess soil management strategies. Mr. Sorensen, welcome, and I shall pass the floor over to you. Um, so I'm going to ask if you can actually come to the podium if you're okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, thank you. Um, today is the International Day of Forests. Everyone, um, sorry, can we um, can we have the pictures that come with? Just uh, we'll just hold for one second. And could you back up one? That's actually page two. Doesn't matter a whole lot. Don't worry about it. It, it. They're not very much different, page one and two. So today is the International Day of Forests. Everyone young and old should have access to a neighborhood forest where mature trees grow and wildlife has a place of refuge to live and raise their young. Walking through a forest for just 15 minutes can lower symptoms of anxiety and depression and boost positive moods. Once a neighborhood has built on every available space, leaving no remaining forest, the wild places that once were all around are now gone. Just such a place is Cataract Way Woods east of Sydenham Road. The last of a formerly very extensive forest is now being clear cut to build the last houses that can be fit into the available space. Virtually every inch of the woods for which Cataract Way Woods was named to commemorate are now just a vague and sad memory, and nothing will remain to remind us of what was once here. All the thousands of people who live here will be bereft of any vestige of the very natural landscape that formerly drew them here in the first place. The very last such place in this neighborhood is the well-forested ridge of the as yet unsold city lot 446. If the little trail that runs along this ridge had ever become a road, this place would no doubt be known as the local lover's lane, since it's the highest point for miles around with a view to match. Should the city, in its wisdom, decide to preserve this beautiful place, it can continue to be a lover's walk for lovers of all ages and a last forest refuge for wildlife for generations to come. As these generations of the future Human and bird and beast and tree will thank the beings of, this, of the past who saw the wisdom of preserving this place. 
So um, we could have the next slide. As I understand, there will soon be houses built right up to the eastern boundary of Lot 446, and it's already clear-cut, meaning most of the extensive and dense forest north and west of Eunice Drive, as seen in this Google view, has already been clear-cut and is permanently gone. Houses are already being built right up to the Power Corridor and Cataraqui Woods Drive on the south side. The very seniors, large seniors complex on the corner of Centennial and Cataraqui Woods Drive uh, is also immediately adjacent to the south side of Lot 446. The number of people, old and young, to, for whom this would be the closest park and natural area would be in the thousands. Next slide. This is uh, from an, the, the ecotreecare.ca survey showing the trees they surveyed, including 16 different species. Next slide. That's unfortunate. It doesn't get to the bottom. This moss line spring is overhung on the uphill side by an old double trunked red oak, meaning the water springs as much from the roots of the tree as it does from the ground and the face of the rock. A spring is universally understood to be sacred space. Mature trees on this lot are particularly worthy protectors of such a sacred space. The positive energy of such a place is a blessing to all who visit or inhabit it. To have such a prospect overlooking such a propitious spring and stream, especially when looking downhill to the south, is well recognized as a particularly lucky and auspicious location. To be in such a place reminds us we must always think and act with seven future generations beyond our own present time firmly in our minds. Next slide. This little pond is high on the ridge immediately below the Red Oak Spring. My guess is that some early settler dug it out to use for a spring house, which in turn suggests it must be reasonably arrived, it must be a reasonably reliable spring. A little conical knoll to the left and downhill would then be the debris from digging the spring house pond. Next slide. This is looking up into the branches of a very tall poplar growing on that little knoll. Next slide. This view is from the same spot on top of the little knoll in the forest beside the spring, now looking north along the ridge towards the broil milk plant, just visible through the branches of all the trees. Next slide. 30 seconds. This is a view of the clearing, again looking towards milk, the milk plant, which you can't see because of the trees. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. And next slide. This drone shot is looking northwest towards the hardwood forest on the ridge with the milk plant in the back, on the right. I pray all these new homeowners and the seniors at the adjacent retirement home will be able to keep this last little corner of refuge of secluded forest and wildlife in their midst. Okay. Thank you for Good. your attention to this important issue of significance far Thank beyond the disposition of some truckloads of displaced soil. And please Thank remember you. to act with seven Thank future you. generations. Thank you very much. firmly in mind. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we'll uh, open it up to questions from Council. Are there any questions? Councilor Sinek. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Mr. Sorensen, uh, for your delegation. Um, I know that you have a copy of the um, uh, environmental study that was done, and I just wondered, um, what did you think about the bat habitat um, in the study? Because I know that you've walked the lands. Yeah, I, um, I, that's one of the things I skipped quickly through, but it struck me a few things about it. First of all, it's, does, it seems a bit odd to do a bat survey in the winter, and you're not really counting any bats at all. Um, and the way it was described, as, uh, uh, as I understand it, they did a survey to figure out how many suitable cavities there were per hectare and surveyed two particular sites, and they came up with a number of 6.7 and 8.6 suitable cavity trees per hectare, which is below the threshold of 10 per hectare. But it strikes me as that really that's measuring suitable habitat, were there to be a single tree, cavity tree with bats, that would be suitable bat habitat, occupied bat habitat. So I'm um, not sure that 
measures up as a, if I can criticize, as, as a way of measuring bats. Even though it seems to follow the letter of the rules. <laughs> Thank you, and my second question is, yeah, the timing of the EIS being done in the winter time, um, do you have any comment on that? Well, um, another picture that went by quickly was of an American woodcock that uh, a friend saw there yesterday already, and that's normal for an American woodcock, um, which is, how did she describe it? She says it's labeled as a conservation watch by the Cornell Bird Lab. I don't think it's a rare bird, but I think it's unusual because it's a shorebird to be living here, even though it's not, it's not, it's not unheard of, it happens. But, um, and it, so it's, it's a returned early, not, uh, sorry, not returned early, it's returned earlier than the deadline that's given for the tree cutting. Uh, but I'd say it's normal time. <laughs> And that's a ground nesting bird, so um, it would be put off by any activity anywhere in the area. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions from council? Okay, Mr. Sorensen, thank you very much. You. Uh, with that, we'll move to our uh, next delegation. We will invite Abby Christie to appear before council to speak to clause four of report number 32 from the CAO with respect to the sleeping cabin's seasonal transition plan. Good evening, Mayor Patterson, council members, and community members here today. My name is Abby. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a District 10 resident and entering my third year of medicine in the fall. As many of us in this room are settlers and uninvited guests on this land, I would also like to acknowledge that we are tr currently on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee and Huron-Wendat territory and home to many indigenous communities today. Similar to a previous speaker, I would also like to note that we were specifically asked not to speak to the potential encampment evictions, nor Bell Park, as these items were not on the agenda for today. And before beginning, I also would like to ask, why were these items not prioritized, nor part of the agenda? As someone who's learning to care for all of you, to care for Kingston, and to care for our community, it sounds like a crisis to me, and it sounds like a priority to me. So, I'm here today to speak on report number 23089, Sleeping Cabins, Seasonal Transitional Plan. As a community member, I recognize the importance of providing low barrier shelter options for people experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. And I do commend the city and commend council for working towards providing these sleeping cabins. As a medical learner, however, I recognize the current housing crisis and the many short-term and long-term health impacts of housing insecurity and homelessness. So following discussions with Our Living Solutions and members of MAC, the Mutual Aid Cataraqui Kingston, I would like to share the four following asks with the council and ask for your immediate attention and response. The first ask to work towards a permanent location for sleeping cabins, as this would improve their community impact. Currently, these cabins move in April and September. This is two moves during the, the year when residents are working towards their health, towards their well-being, and towards making sure that they're able to stay safely. The second ask is to open a second location for the sleeping cabins and increase overall funding towards them. We learned that the wait list for the sleeping cabins is over 300 people. This is the size of a small school, the size of a class, the size of some of the classrooms that I've been in as a student. This is a large number of people waiting to be able to join the sleeping cabins. And this includes ICH encampment residents. Having a second location and additional funding would address these needs. It's important to also recognize that the existing shelter model stigmatizes people who use substances. Oftentimes, to enter a shelter, abstinence is a requirement. However, at the sleeping cabins and at the ICH, where many encampment residents stay, this is not a requirement. As a care provider and understanding the housing first model, we want to also emphasize that there should be no requirements to housing provided by the city. 
Our third ask for healthcare benefits for staff. This is needed not only at sleeping cabins, but at all shelter locations. Currently staff are paid around $20 an hour. And this does not include health benefits. So we urge council to work towards this for increased funding for staff who work extensive hours caring for folks and are very much deserving of health benefits. Finally, we ask for improved communication with community members and collaborators. Many times the city has stated that they have engaged with encampment residents. However, for many community groups, for many encampment residents, we know this is not the case. Please clarify how you are engaging and how you are meaningfully consulting with these community members. So finally, in closing, Many of us today will return to warm, safe, and guaranteed living spaces, myself included. So I urge you to consider the Kingston community members who are relying on the sleeping cabins, relying on the encampments currently at threat of eviction, and the highly detrimental health, community, and human rights impacts of these evictions. Encampment residents are human beings. Encampment residents are community members and should be centered in any decisions that will impact them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Council Ridge. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, just can you quickly repeat those four points again? Sure. Thank you. So our first ask, one moment was to work towards a permanent location for sleeping cabins, as currently they move between the Portsmouth Olympic Harbor and Center 70. Our second ask is to open a second location, again, permanent location for these cabins, as again, we commend the city for introducing them. However, this is ideal year round. Our third ask is for healthcare benefits for staff, not only at the, health, at the sleeping cabins, but at all shelters. Um, any staff, any employee uh, should have healthcare benefits. And finally, for improved communication with community members and collaborators. So we urge you to reach out to the Kingston Union of Tenants that spoke earlier today, to Mutual Aid, Kairaki Kingston, to Our Living Services, as well as the many, many organizations working on this issue. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions? Councillor Sun? Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Uh, would you like to share that uh, all those employees work on those shelters, are they city's employee or they are employee of those such organizations they work with? Uh, pardon me, do you mind repeating the question? You said the people or the employees work on those uh, areas like ICH or with the organizations uh, providing services to the uh, sleeping cabin or the other areas of the people uh, living. Um, are they our city employees, the city providing that services? For the, you're looking for benefits for those people who are working on that, right? Uh, for health Or you're recommending the benefits. So are those people our city's employee? Uh, so, I, so for the most part, no, but I would have to follow up on that and get back to you. I uh, sorry, were there, was there any other questions? Okay. Um, Ms. Christie, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, with that, we'll move to our uh, final delegation this evening. We will invite uh, Crystal Wilson to appear before council to speak to clause four of report number 32 from the CAO, again, with respect to sleeping cabins seasonal transition plan. Uh, Ms. Wilson, welcome, and uh, you have the floor. Great, good evening. I um, thank you for allowing us to speak tonight and to um, consider extending our funding and um, the seasonal transition plan for the sleeping cabins. I have with me tonight, I'm actually at our um, sleeping cabins location at Portsmouth Olympic Harbor and have with me most of our residents are in the audience and as well um, a few of our staff who are available to answer questions if you have questions about what it's like to live in the cabins or what it's like to work at the sleeping cabin initiative. Um, I also have with me, <laughs> kind of behind me, Tony Stortz has joined us from um, Hamilton. He was instrumental in getting Kitchener's a better tent city off the ground and has been helping the the Hamilton community try to launch a, a cabin community as well. Um, so he's available to ask questions. He's um, very skilled at um, uh, procedural and policy around municipal government, <clears throat> but he's available to talk about some of the other initiatives that are, ha that are happening throughout the province. Um, 
So I, I I know I've been before council a number of times and I always kind of think, what do you guys want to hear from me this time? Um, <laughs> I spoke with a very lovely counselor this morning who suggested that the best thing to do was to let you know what, what we need. Um, and as you heard from um, Abby, the, the previous delegate, um, moving towards a permanent location is really important um, to help stabilize the people we're supporting. It, you know, we none of us knew if if the sleeping cabin, cabin initiative would, would work, but we were trying to listen to the people that uh, that were at the Bell Park encampment in 2020 about what needs, you know, what would work for them. And 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 this I this is that's where um, for some of you who weren't around, that's where this idea came from is the people who are at Bell Park in that encampment. Um, and so you know, with, with a lot of, um, you know, uncertainty, we, we launched this, um, this pilot project. And I think what we've been able to show council staff and the broader community as is that this, this initiative is helping to stabilize people and it is helping to bring people away from tents and away from en encampments in the streets. People who normally wouldn't engage in the traditional model have had um, really great successes here. Um, and you know, we've been able to divert people from hospital visits. We've been able to divert people from incarceration. Um, we had twice convinced judges that um, the, the, the people that were before them were better off in our program than um, to be in a jail cell, and they, it, which was <laughs> great to be able to prevent um, more incarceration. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the way we measure success in the system right now, um, it's a it's a check mark about housing, but we need to consider all of, we need to consider the person and the community and and consider, um, you know, what it what it takes to actually stabilize somebody and, and help them be successful in housing. Um, so one of my asks is to rethink how success is considered it at the municipal level and the, the city model level our our reporting to the city only measures um if somebody's housed it doesn't it, so in 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 my you know kind of thinking about how we should do this um when my when i lived in virginia and in, in fairfax county my children were assessed um in the public school system when they entered a grade and then reassessed at the end to see what and, and measured on uh, the teachers were measured on their improvements and i think that kind of model for the people we're supporting is really important because we've had some great successes with people um getting everything in place to to help them become houseable but um they've moved on from the program and were housed by another agency that you know, that check mark goes to the other agency, which is great. We just care that the people were supported and housed. Um, but when you look at our report and it says we've only housed three people, that's not actually true. We've helped a number of people who aren't, um, who are outside of our cabins, but if they're not living in the cabins when they're housed, it doesn't count. Um, and I think we should rethink how that, that measurement happens and recognize that it takes uh, you know, a number of agencies, people collaborating together, agencies all wrapping around supports around a person to be able to get them housed. And it takes some stuff that the system doesn't measure. Like we we just had um, a person, um, it's, it caused a lot of tears and I might start tearing up, um, who was um, disengaged from his family for 30 years. They just reconnected with him. They thought he had died. Um, and had no idea where he had gone to. And now his whole family, they're planning on coming here to see him because they, 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 they're they so excited that, that you know, they, what they thought had happened hadn't happened. Um, that That's so important to be able to stabilize somebody once they move to housing or a permanent situation. They need to have those family connections. And, and we do that work to be able to pull them together. So it's a lot more than just putting somebody in a house. It's about putting the whole, you know, supporting the whole person, identifying where they're at, helping them move to a more positive uh, place. Um, and, you know, the system should measure those whole things as opposed to just that check mark on housing. 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> And then um, Abby spoke before about benefits. It's really good work. What we do is really, it's really challenging work. And we're asking frontline workers across the board, not just our staff um, in the cabin community who are phenomenal, but um, staff across the board in the front lines, they need to be supported. They need to be paid higher wages that are above, um, you know, almost the poverty level. They're just sitting at the poverty level with their, the wages that the system allows, and they don't have health benefits. We need to get them health benefits. So if, you know, we can help through funding or you know, an initiative maybe that okay. improves health benefits across Great. the board. Thank you. Help. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions from members of council? Councilor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, Crystal, thank you very much for this presentation. I've been meaning to connect with you for a long time. Um, sorry. Um, one question I have is that 
Um, you mentioned that there are operational issues. What would you say would be the greatest operational issue, and is that staff burnout? Uh, briefly. Um. We, we, we all have to remember that, and I have to remind myself that we started from nothing. We weren't even a service provider. We weren't a nonprofit anything. We started from building a nonprofit. So in a year, we have, you know, we've gone through a lot of learning to understand what it takes to, to run this kind of community. And we've been sharing that, that learning with other communities. But for our staff, we have built a counseling program. So the rents that um, residents pay through their um, shelter allowances, we actually divert that to a counseling program. Um, um, to make sure that they're supported when um, when traumatic events happen, we've experienced in you know in the year we've experienced the the fire that you know about. We had uh, the death of two residents, and we had the death of a really key core staff member. Um, you know, those for all of us are really. Um, difficult events to go through and we need to make sure that staff are supported so that we don't have turnover. Um, the other thing for us is that we can only staff, offer staff contracts based on um, our funding. So right now all of our staff contracts end April 30th. Um, if our fund is, is extended, we can extend those contracts to whatever the, the extended funding date is. We can't offer staff permanent, um, permanent jobs because we don't have a permanent location. We don't have permanent funding. We need to move towards that to be able to support our staff properly. Um, operationally, we, we're supposed to be a transition location. So we're supposed to be transition housing. Our goal is to create an, an, an um support independent living. Um, but when we move twice a year, it dis and we're supposed to move people on within a year, or 364 days. But if we move twice a year, the anxiety that builds up before the move and the resettling after the move, it uses up a lot of that year time. So, you know, I, I understand that it was a pilot project, but I think it's time to really look at a permanent location. Um, it, it's time to think that, you know, to, to stabilize both our residents and our staff members and, and say that this is an initiative that deserves to move forward in a permanent way. Thank you. Councillor Stephen. Thank you, and through you, thank you, Crystal, for your uh, presentation and your, your company there as well. Um, so over the past year, I'd say it's safe to say you've made believers out of a lot of people, um, but there is still some pushback in different parts of the community, and I think it's important to acknowledge that this is a program that comes with responsibilities for residents. Um, so pending a permanent location, obviously that's the ultimate goal here, um, for anyone out there who may be unsure about having the sleep and cabin folks as their neighbors, could you just speak briefly to the expectations that are in place with this program? Thank you. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, it's not, um, there's, I would say there's rules. People like to hear there's rules, but we expect our, our, we expect our residents to be good neighbors, to have good communications with our neighbors. And I think um, council has received a number of letters from our neighbors that are closest to us um, to, you know, reinforce the fact that and some, most of them don't even know we're here because we're so quiet. Um, but being respectful in terms of their behavior around neighbors and the neighborhood, taking care of the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, they, they um, they're expected to clean up after themselves. They're expected to, you know, behave in a way that would be more akin to living in an apartment um, or in, in regular housing, right? So be good neighbors is a big part of it. Um, we, you know, there was a lot of nervousness around us um, being near the boats that are on the hard um, beside us. Um, I guarantee you all of our residents, they defend the boats. We patrol those boats at night. We did, we've, I recently kicked off some students that were a little uh, intoxicated off one of the boats recently. Um, we, we make sure that we protect the neighborhood and that's, that's imposed on our, um, on our residents as well. And any interference with the neighborhood um, by a resident would result in, in discharge from the program. Thank you for that. I would, if I can add to it a little bit, what we found is a really positive interaction with our neighbors. Um, once they get to know us, once they meet our residents, a number of neighbors volunteer for us. They, they bring us food. They, today, a neighbor took um, somebody to a medical appointment. We've really um, developed positive relationships with our neighbors, and, and that, that helps to enhance the program we're offering to our residents because they're treated, they're treated really positively by our neighbors, and you know that's important for them to transition into to the regular community to be treated with respect and, and instead of some of the stigmatizing um, activities that can happen when they're, when they're out in the streets or in encampments. Uh, thank you, Councillor Amos. 
Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Uh, Crystal, I want to say thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, I've gone, I've been to your facility, I've talked to you directly in regards to your program, and uh, I didn't know much about it at first. You and I touched base e email-wise, and I was able to come down and see your facility, and, it, and you're doing great work. Um, one, I want to acknowledge that. Two, I've received a number of emails and letters uh, from immediate residents uh, in the village, uh, Portsmouth Village, indicating their pleasure and their experiences that they have had with the, the Sleeping Cabin program. So kudos to, to you and your staff. Um, and it's great to hear that uh, Portsmouth residents and Sleeping Cabin residents uh, are able to find some common bonds and, and helping each other out. So it's fantastic that way. Um, blue, sky, blue, blue sky question for you. Um, what would a permanent location look like for you? What, what would have the ideal amenities? Uh, and I'm sure you've thought about this for uh, a while now. Um, if you could give me a, a small list, uh, not extensive, but your top list of, uh, I, wish, I wish if we moved to a permanent location, it would have this. Um, well, it would have a little bit more space. It would have some natural environment. Um, one of the locations that had been considered for a permanent location we thought was quite ideal, um, you know, if I say it publicly, we might get in trouble. But, you know, Lemoyne's Point Farm has is absolutely ideal as a location. Um, we don't need to be, we hear a lot of um, discussion about needing to be near core services. The core services come to us. So we, we don't need to be in the downtown core, and we don't actually want to be in the downtown core because um, there's negative distractions from people finding wellness. So we'd actually like to be further away from the downtown core, um, still have an ability to transport, but many of our residents have taxi accounts or, or neighbors willing to transport, and I transport people, so that's not usually an issue. Um, having a place where we can really create it ourselves, um, you know, create gardens. Lots of people here want to get involved in gardening, whether it's vegetables, or, or fruit and having some natural environment in the space. Um, in terms of amenities, we, we just need basics. We need kitchen, bathroom, shower, um, and, um, and then it would be really nice. We, we actually have four um, units donated to us that are stuck where they are because we don't, we don't know where to move them yet that ha are, are self-contained. They have kitchens and bathrooms. They just need to be hooked up to infrastructure. Um, for the people who are ready to move to, to a, a more self-contained environment. So we would like to have the cabins to help take people as they are and then as they're ready, move them into more self-contained units. Um, and so we do have four donated to us, but they're um, stuck in a parking lot right now <laughs> waiting for us to find a permanent location. So it would be ideal if we had some cabins, some self-contained units and still the common, I think it works really well having the common area um, with shared resources. Thank you. Councillor Glenn. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you very much, Crystal, for the presentation and for your kind description earlier. Um, my questions are, are uh, fairly succinct. So can you just confirm um, the low barrier aspect of the sleeping cabins? Because we're often asked about low barrier access. So can you confirm that for me, please? Yep. Um, we, we take people as they are. That's it. Like, there's no... You know, we don't look, um, we, we support people how they are right there, you know, at the time that they're moving into the cabins. So if they're a substance user, absence is not the requirement of the program. There is harm reduction supports. We do expect, um, you know, eventually, like for people to eventually um, participate in cessation programs. Um, there's no, absolutely no uh, substance use in our common building or in the public. Um, but what people do in their cabins, that's their choice. All of our staffers are prepared and, and trained to be able to respond to an, an opiate um, poisoning emergency if it happens. We just haven't had them <laughs> knocking on wood, haven't had that happen yet. Um, and then we also, find it's very important that we support people with um, physical mobility challenges. Um, we have four uh, cabins that are ramped right now. The interior of Portsmouth Olympic Harbor is fully accessible to our, um, our residents have mobility challenges. Um, it's a little bit trickier moving to Center 70 this time because we, we won't be able to support people who are in wheelchairs, whereas at, at Portsmouth we can. Um, and, you know, it's it, the number of people that are losing their housing right now who are seniors and people with disabilities, we absolutely have to make sure that we create, a, we create spaces for people who have mobility challenges. And we, we try to do that the best we can. 
Okay, one, one other question. Um, so earlier on in your presentation, you alluded to the metrics being used to determine how people are housed. Um, so one of the things that I want to confirm with you are some of the services that you have um, basically grown to uh, providing. So we know that in order for people to access funding and for individuals to access housing, they need to have ID and access to public funds. Um, so can you speak to that? Are you providing those sorts of services, helping people access um, physical identification, bank accounts, that sort of thing? Are you providing those kinds of services? Mm -hmm. So we, we, you know, we when we when somebody joins our program, we meet with them and find out at that time what they feel they need to um, achieve with us to be able to become houseable. And so that very often, almost always, includes getting their birth certificate, getting their health card, getting their taxes up to date, getting their income sorted out, um, medical, dental, uh, court, it could be courts um, access. So whatever it is the person needs, we address that. And we try to work with other service providers where they have expertise as well. Um, what we One of the things that we found, um, and we do this as, as much as we, you know, we can, we try to uh, speed up time and, and decrease barriers. So one of the things that was really a barrier to getting people along the, you know, the path to wellness was getting their birth certificates in place. It takes a long time. So what we, and, and getting it paid for, because we don't have a budget for that. Um, so what we ended up doing was signing up to be part of the fee waiver program with the Ontario government. So we are now um, qualified to process birth certificates for free for people who identify as um, homelessness. So we offer that service, not just for our residents, but for anybody in the community who needs their birth certificates processed. Um, and then, um, you know, we we also work with Service Canada. So we have a pilot project um, with Service Canada because, you know, for, for, for care coordinator, our, our staff to sit on the phone for hours waiting for somebody to answer the phone so we can get an address updated or get their tax information sorted out. It, it's a lot. Um, and, and I'm sure the general public and you all understand what it's like to get in touch with um, federal level, levels of government. Um, so we are in a pilot project with Service Canada right now. And what we do is send them a form, tell them when we're available to meet and when our resident is available to meet and they call us instead and it's the same person we talk to at each time so they understand the program and what we're trying to achieve so they don't ask the same questions all over again and they're able to pro uh, to um, process the transactions while we're on the phone with them it's been a it's been a really um you know nice initiative to be able to move people forward without um traditional red tape barriers okay I uh, seeing no other questions. Ms. Wilson, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move on. Uh, in our agenda, we have no further delegations. Uh, so, um, we have no briefings tonight. Are there any petitions to present? Okay, seeing none, we do have one motion of congratulations, moved by Councillor Sahn, seconded by Mayor Patterson. The King's City Council extend its congratulations to all Kingstonians who will be observing Ramadan this week. Every year, Muslims worldwide anticipate the sighting of the new crescent moon that signifies the official first day of Ramadan, the ninth month of the Islamic calendar and most sacred month in Islamic culture. The start of Ramadan fluctuates each year because the Islamic lunar calendar follows the phases of the moon. This year, Ramadan is predicted to begin on March 23rd and to end on April 21st with Eid celebrations. To all celebrating, we wish you a joyous Ramadan filled with faith and reflection. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Okay, uh, we will now, we have no deferred motions, so we will now move on to reports. First up, we have report number 31 from the CAO. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. I just want to point out that item two is uh, one that Councillor Bohm has declared a conflict on. Uh, moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Stephen, that report number 31 from the Chief Administrative Officer consent be received and adopted. Okay, so we're already separating item two. Uh, would anyone like either item one or item three um, dealt with on its own? Seeing none, we'll first do the vote on uh, clauses one and clause three. So clause one, approval of revised emergency detour route, and clause three, green standard community improvement plan. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. So now we'll circle back to clause two, update on excess soil management strategies. Uh, Councillor Bohm has uh, stepped away. Councillor Tozo. 
Thank you, Your Worship, through you. So a question I have for staff is based on some of the discussion that was done about uh, the carbon impact of not transporting soil through to, to a different location and how much that would save. So we know that there are some trees there. Um, can you just do me like a quick idea of how much carbon emissions we would save by going forward with this and adding the soil versus transporting the soil? Just a rough estimate. Like if we did a cost benefit analysis of carbon emissions from doing one to doing nothing, what would be the impact? Mr. Richmond. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we've estimated that by diverting soils to landfill and third party beneficial receiving sites out of town, we would save approximately 2,723 tons of carbon emissions over the three year uh, life cycle of the project. So I, how much carbon is being absorbed now through the current trees that are there? Thank you, and through you, um, we have estimated using our best um, sequestration numbers um, that to sequester that same amount would take around 7,000 trees. Um, there's currently around 500 trees on the site. Okay. Um, is there, if those trees are removed, is there a tree planting program to put new trees in or is it just they're done and that's it? Commissioner Joyce. Thank you and through you, Your Worship. Uh, yes, we have a fairly aggressive tree planting program in the city of Kingston and we would be seeking to uh, amend that by additional tree plantings. Thank you. Any other discussion? Councilor Ridge. Thank you, Your Worship and through you. Um, just to, just to thinking about canopy coverage, I'm just curious if staff have a number uh, or an estimate regarding how many large trees we've lost in the last 10 years. Commissioner Joyce. Thank you, through you. Uh, I don't have that off the top of my head. Obviously the no. um, emerald ash borer uh, has continued to be a problem. We continue to lose a lot of ash trees in the city of Kingston, we continue to remove trees. We do inventory those when we're pulling them out. Um, so I have uh, statistics on the number of trees, but uh, the size particular would take a little, quite a bit more work for us to bring that to you. Okay, uh, thank you. And just a follow up question, uh, just regarding the calculation of our canopy coverage, um, in general, this area is considered part of that, is that correct? So when we look at canopy coverage, um, we are looking at the entire city of Kingston now, so both the urban uh, area that this covers as well as the um, outlying areas. So the and the other thing is, as you may or may not know, but we're going to be doing that canopy coverage on an annual basis so we can see very clearly the changes and we're hoping to move to looking at it from that canopy actual coverage because there has been uh, um, very valid uh, concerns about doing it by a tree count when the size of the tree matters. So in this case, size certainly matters. And when you look at the canopy, that's a critical piece of that. So what we're trying to move towards is assessing the tree canopy so that it takes out that, that um, uh, lack of equivalency in terms of tree count. So 10 trees removed, 10 large trees removed certainly doesn't equal uh, 10 saplings planted, right? So by doing annual canopy coverage, uh, assessments, we'll have a much better understanding of how well we're doing in terms of protecting and preserving and uh, enhancing our canopy coverage in all areas of Kingston. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Sanek. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, I see Councillor Shaves, he's got his hand up as well, but because um, I'm going to move something, but 
I can go. <laughs> it's just. Um, sure, I'll go. Sorry, it's just that I saw your I saw your hand first, or I thought I did. So, yeah, um, yeah go, go go ahead. We'll see what happens. <laughs> okay, so I'm reading this report um, last week. Um, I appreciate staff time um, with uh, Councillor Shaves and I. Last week we met with um, uh, uh, Mr. Like, Director Forrest and Mr. Um, Richmond for one hour and uh, to learn more about this and I appreciate staff about preserving the trees that they have in our report in that northwest corner I, I really appreciate this and I wish there was an easy solution that we're putting excess soil where already something's been you know there's no trees involved at all like that would be the best solution because I know we want to try to save greenhouse gas emissions by not uh, traveling with the soil to dump it somewhere very far away. But, um, you know, like this is the Cataraque Business Park original plan uh, back in 2010. And going through um, the details of the environmental assessment that was done back then, um, you know, a lot has changed in the world since then. You know, biodiversity was not even mentioned in the report because no one even knew about the loss of biodiversity uh, back then. We didn't even mention climate change in the EIA that was done in 2010. So much has changed. But we have, like, continued to, you know, develop this business park, and a lot of trees um, have been cut down for this. Um, one thing that was mentioned in the um, 2010 EIS was um, a juniper hair streak butterfly that was prominent in red juniper areas, which is also eastern red cedar areas, uh, where the royal milk plant is. But now there's no trees left, but we do have some 80-year-old um, oak, uh, sorry, red cedar trees on this lot 446 where we're going to remove the 154 trees and put all the fill. And since the most recent environmental report is from either February 3rd or March 2nd, I, I can't tell which, but it was done, you know, a month ago, two months ago at the most, um, it doesn't, it was done in the winter time, so you wouldn't have been able to have seen if the butterfly is still on the lands or not. And it's a rare and it's a species at risk. Um, so, you know, like there's some problems with it. And then um, one of Mr. Sorensen was mentioning the um, American woodcock, which is actually from Texas. And uh, someone saw it on lot 446 just yesterday. And so um, the birds have already migrated, you know, like in the um, study, it talks about April 11th as being the cutoff for the Bird Act. But um, people have also sent me information that it actually cuts in April 1st with climate change. You know, it's earlier now. So if it's like, can we really even cut 154 trees between tomorrow and next Saturday, which is April 1st? Like, I kind of feel like, this report is now too late. It's just not enough time to get the clearing done. And I think we need to kind of step back and, and think of this some more. We also have, um, you know, like the UN climate change report just came out yesterday. This has been all in the media. And every tree counts now. Every tree counts. That's what that report said. Uh, like it's the doomsday clock is, is ticking, right? So the bottom line is that we need another place to put the soil that doesn't take cutting down 154 trees. Um, uh, let's see. Um, and then we're going in our tr strategic planning session next week. And how can we go in this session and actually look ourselves in the eyes and say, yep, yep, we need to be more green. We need to protect the environment. When here, this is proposing 154 trees between tomorrow and April 1st. So I have um, an amendment, uh, okay. a deferral. A deferral. Okay. Yes. So can we just, uh, do the clerks have that? We're going to say that. Okay. So we have a motion to uh, defer moved by Councillor Sanic, seconded by Councillor Stephen, that Clause 2, Report Number 31, received from the CAO, be deferred in order for staff to provide options for al alternate sites for the excess soil and bring the options to EITP committee by the end of Q2 2023. Okay, so Councillor Sanic, uh, you have in some ways already spoken to this, but you now have the floor. Just a reminder to Council that on motion to defers, you have one minute 
Uh, so you have to be far more succinct in your comments, and you can speak to time, place, or purpose. Uh, Councilor Sennett, you have the floor. I know that staff said that um, for um, regarding to timing, um, it was important to have um, a place to put the soil from the Cataraqui Woods Drive extension that the construction um, was to start beginning. And, uh, you know, that's what can be discussed at EIT committee. Like, is there really not any other place where we can put the soil? Um, for that options, you know, it can still be lot 446, but what other sites were struck out and why were they struck out? And I just think, too, for the public, um, for them to get more details on the alternate sites, um, that is most important. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, for you. A question for staff. What would be the implications economically or for the region for deferral of this uh, motion? Would it have dramatic consequences on timelines as far as the business community is concerned? Um, give me, can, is that a fair question, Your Worship? Uh, Mr. Forst. Uh, yeah, through you. Um, so the, the impact that we know right now, we don't have any other sites available as it references in the report. So any of the uh, projects that would be set for the season would have to ensure they have the budget to send the uh, soils to landfill. And we would incur those costs as well as the additional traveling um, times to get the soil there. Uh, so we would have to go back and ensure those capital projects have the adequate budget to do so. Um, and then uh, we'd have to start assessing for other sites because we don't have another site currently. So we would transport the soil anyways and it would incur a larger carbon debt rather than go proceeding with this is that correct mr forrest through you uh yeah the carbon debt plus the cost it would oh. increase the cost as the report reflects okay yeah. thank you councillor stephen thank you and through you mr mayor um so first off uh, i appreciate the consideration staff to give to that corner piece and keeping the tree canopy there. I think that um, I also appreciate wanting to move this along quickly. I, I, I get that. I know there is a demand for industrial land that's been made very clear. Um, I think that sending this report back to EITP is the right thing to do in this case because it's not saying soil can't go here, but what it is saying is maybe we aren't clearing this entire lot now and putting the soil in. Maybe there's a way that this can be done right with consideration for the other pieces of nature that, you know, we do operate with. Um, so that's my two cents. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Shapes. Thank you. A um, number of questions first. Where is the closest place that we can take the soil, dump the soil if this doesn't happen? Mr. Richmond. Thank you. And through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we currently don't have any regional beneficial reuse soil sites in the entire region that we know of. And so the closest site would be uh, two landfills, um, uh, most notably Moose Creek and Ottawa landfill. And distance-wise, how, how long would that be? So it's near, near Ottawa, Mr. Richmond? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I can okay. uh, so Google that. From Kingston to Ottawa? In, yeah, in excess of 200 kilometers. Okay. And that's one, one way. And you already mentioned that uh, this is an estimate of 2,727 tons of CO2 emissions that uh, this could cause if we were shipping it to those distances, correct? Mr. Richmond? Through you, yes, that is correct based on um, uh, trucking to either landfill or outside regional centers, which in the past we have had small centers, but we no longer have those available today. So there is an there is a environmental benefit from doing this at this current time with this site. Through you, Mr. Mayor, that would be my um, opinion, yes. Okay. Um, and what is the cost of transporting the soil to that distance or to those? So, Councilor Shays, I'm just going to pause and let you know you have about 10 seconds left on the clock because you only have a minute. Um, but I stop the clock every time you ask a question. 
we are done ans uh, asking the question. Mr. Richmond. Thank you, and through you, um, the cost to uh, landfill this, including transport and tipping fees, would be in the order of 200 to $240 per cubic meter. Okay. Um, I do have concerns about losing trees. Uh, we're not losing all those trees. Uh, we are, they're, they're planning on cutting 154. There are over 300 still left in the one corner. Um, but there's also that environmental issue of Okay. that 2,727 tons of so, emissions that we'd okay. be dealing with and so, the cost. So, Councillor Shays, I'm sorry, I'm sorry you're, you're over a minute now, so I'm going to have to uh, have to move on. Uh, next up is Councillor Glenn. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, if we defer, which projects will be held up? Mr. Forrest. I can't answer that right now. I'm not saying they would necessarily be held up. I think it would be more, they would have to confirm the cost increase that would might happen from shipping these elsewhere. So I can't, we couldn't confirm right now if there would be a hold up, but there would be a financial impact. Do we know what the extent of that financial impact will look like if it's held up for three months? Mr. Forrest? Through, through you, without knowing the specifics of the project, it would be the cost and report for shipping it off site versus shipping it to our receiving site. So the 115. Commissioner Joyce? So I think it's important to understand that, that the impact of this affects both uh, City of Kingston projects and Utilities Kingston projects. Um, the site is quite important and cost of transference of soil and disposal of soil is very expensive. We are talking millions of dollars here. This, this isn't a small change by any measure. So the impact is fairly uh, significant on the projects. I would expect that, in fact, on some projects, it may require us to revisit some of the capital plans because of the additional costs associated with disposing of soils to a landfill. We budget based on having um, the, the site within Kingston to do this, as we have in the past, both Utilities Kingston and the City of Kingston. So it would be fairly significant. The other impact would possibly be where we review the projects and, and, and uh, delay projects. So that's also an option or an impact. So would it be safe to say that this will impact sewer repairs, road work, and all of those things that we just talked about recently at budget. Commissioner Joyce. Thank you, and through you, I don't want to speak for Utilities Kingston, I see them sitting over there, um, but I would uh, expect that it could potentially lead to some delays. Okay, and one final question. So why must all 154 trees be removed? It looks like a very large lot. So do we need to remove all 154 in order to um, put the soil on there? Um, is there an alternative? Um, just some thoughts. Mr. Forrest? Yeah, through your worship. Uh, as we, as it's been identified, we tried to take a balanced approach on the site. So we we looked at what we could keep uh, while also trying to um, allow the site to receive the soil, uh, address the grade um, changes that have to be accommodated. So there was a, a balanced view of what trees needed to be removed in order to proceed with the project while still preserving as many as we could. So there's also the entrance that had to be created, and then being able to actually do the project while protecting that upper ridge area. Councilor Glenn, you have about 10 seconds on the clock, if there's anything else. Okay, uh, next on my list uh, is Councilor Amos and then Councilor Sum. Councilor Amos. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Amos, then Councilor McClare, and then Councilor Sum. Councilor Amos. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Fell. Um, what would be the financial impact of this if, if uh, your projects were not able to go forward right away, and um, is one of those uh, a major project on King Street? Mr. 
Mr. Fell. Thank you, through, your, through you, Your Worship. We would have to go back project by project and do a cost assessment, and it would depend on the timeline. Um, and the volume from each one of those projects would have to be assessed based on the tipping fees. Thank you. That's it. Council McLaren. Thank you. Can, um, if we were to defer this and you were to come back with a different set of um, locations, could we assume that these locations would be further out and that there would be likely more trees the further out we go that might be, have to be sacrificed in order to get this accomplished? Mr. Forrest. Yeah, through your worship. So we have reviewed the city's own sites that we, we have. This was the best option based on it being an employment land. Also part of the regulation, and it says in the report, it has to be a soil that uh, requires soil. So it, it was also identified that this was a, a site that required a significant amount of soil to raise the grade to a usable level. Um, all the other sites we have probably have more challenges in terms of tree removal or the ability to develop them without a, a current plan for them. Um, and likely, if we don't use this site, we would probably have to pursue another property. Thank you. So from what I heard there is the likelihood is that we will be sacrificing more trees if we don't do it here. Mr. Forrest? Potentially, depending on what site we were, we were required to go forward with, yeah. Councillor Sun. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Um, the cost we will absorb, if we adopted this motion, is definitely it's going to be cost to the time, and if we're taking soil somewhere else, it's also going to cost us more. Who is going to uh, absorb this cost or take in over that, that, that cost? Mr. Forrest? So the cost of the development of, maybe I just need to clarify, the cost of the development of the site or the if, cost on if the If we definitely this motion and asking to go find another location and it's further up, it definitely is going to be a cost involved in there. So if we have to pay extra money to not going through with this project, we'll find another place, who is paying for that cost, the extra money to, to this project? Mr. Forrest? Yeah, through you, Your Worship. Uh, yeah, we would incur that additional cost. That would be a cost on the city for either an additional site or the, the travel costs on the project to other locations. And it's uh, just echoing uh, Councillor McLaren's uh, question also, how difficult it will be to find an other location where we have less tree within the city boundaries? Uh, what is the other requirements are attached to it to find a proper place where we can take that kind of soil, how difficult uh, it can be for the city to find a place within the city boundary. Okay, Mr. Forrest? Yes, through you. So uh, we've already identified in previous council meetings the challenge of available land in the city, and further and on top of that, uh, without trees, and then a site that, require, that would actually require soil. So there would be quite a, a set of parameters that would limit the availability of land in the city. So, so Councillor Son, I'm sorry, you're, you're actually past one minute. Again, a motion to defer is tricky. You've got to be really quick. It's not uh, much shorter than normal five minutes. Uh, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? I take the chair and recognize you. Thank you. I will be very quick. Again, speaking to the purpose of this deferral, my concern is that the original staff recommendation, it makes environmental sense in the big picture. I am going to ask Council to think of the big picture here in terms of not only cost savings, but also savings on GHG emissions, savings on trees of having to look at another site. This makes sense. I appreciate where the motion defer is coming from, but I actually do not think that the, um, the benefits outweigh the cost in this case. Thank you. I return the chair. Thank you. Anybody that wants to speak to the motion defer that has not already spoken? Councillor Osterhoff. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and I um, appreciate what you just said too. And I, um, I, I think it is a challenge for us to, when we see these uh, these events unfold, and, and the necessity of uh, of the development that we have, and, and the long term plans that are coming together. And uh, so I, I I can't support the amendment because I, I believe that we need to uh, move ahead with uh, with this. And um, 
I just want to say that, and I know that it's, it's a hard thing sometimes, and we're, we're facing a lot of different uh, issues today in biodiversity, but um, this is an important uh, time to move forward as well, and we will see uh, overall uh, benefit to the environment by moving ahead. Thank you. Anybody else? Deputy Mayor Cheney. Um, I just had a question about uh, once you grade this with the soil, I'm assuming it's going to make it more attractive for um, finding um, a, a suitable um, person to purchase um, for this employment land. Mr. Forrest? Yeah, through you. So the intention is not just to dump the soil, but to grade it and compact it to a usable state so it's developable on the site. So the, the property would actually be managed so that when it is sold, it's, it's something a, a developer would actually be able to work with, not just dump a place to put the soil. Councillor Senate, you have the last word if there's anything else you want to say on the motion to defer. I have the last word. You have the last word. You have one minute. You do. It's your motion. Anyway, like I said at the beginning, right, I really wish we could just pick another location that does not involve removing 154 trees. Like, this is like, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul. So, yeah, uh, great, saving greenhouse gases, but we're cutting down 154 trees in this day and age. It just doesn't make any sense. And all I wanted to know is what other locations had been picked. I think there's only two, like Clogs Road gets a mention, Knox Farm gets a mention in the report. Surely we thought, looked at other places, like in front of Point Pleasant Water Treatment Plant, maybe. We got all that flat land. Like where else does the city own land where we could put this or where we're about to build, you know, something and we can start filling? <laughs> Anyway, very disappointing because I can see how this is going. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we will call the vote on the motion to defer. All those in favor? Opposed? And that loses by a vote of three to nine. Uh, Councillor Osanic, Ridge, and Stephen uh, in the minority. Okay, so we're now back to the original uh, clause two as not amended. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Glenn. Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. I just had one further question about the site. Um, so are there any concerns with removing the 154 trees and um, flooding as a result because there's no trees to take the water up? Mr. Richmond. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, part of our studies include detailed geotechnical studies um, which are forthcoming with placement of soils and drainage swales and uh, potential for uh, things like geomembranes and uh, compaction to ensure that that does not happen. Okay, uh, Councillor Shafes. Mm, thank you. Um, in our, our conversation earlier this week, it was mentioned that there was a potentially, well, it's also in the report, uh, potential savings of $8 million over the three years by diverting these soils locally. Um, my question is, was these funds already included in the budget already? And would this be an actual savings when we come to our next budget? Mr. Forrest? Through you. Uh, I don't know the exact amount that was budgeted for this year's project and the timing of that, but in out years, it would definitely be a savings because we would incorporate that into the, the plans for future budget years and any capital projects because we would have a site. Okay, so that seems like a, a good tax rebate savings. Um, it was also mentioned that uh, we have lost a number of trees throughout the years, but uh, my understanding is that across the street, the milk plant, they're planting over 400 trees this spring. Can you confirm that? Mr. Forrest? Through you, uh, yes, they have a landscape plan to put in 450, a variety of trees on the uh, Royal Canadian milk plant this spring. Okay, thank you. And earlier this year, it was mentioned that uh, we're working on the tree canopy plan for the urban city. Um, can you remind us of the three locations, how many trees are being planted this year? 
Commissioner Joyce? Sorry, I'm going to ask that you repeat that. Um, earlier this year, it was discussed with the tree planting that we're doing in, on three sites on the east end. Um, how many trees were planned to be planted in the next couple of years? Right. Uh, thank you, and through you, Your Worship. So we're planning on planting, I think I recall, around 48,000 trees on those properties. Okay, so we are doing something for our tree canopy. Um, also, um, is it, you, we meant, you also mentioned in regards to the difference between planting saplings and cutting down mature trees. So are, are we planning on replacing at a higher ratio than one to one? Are those 154 trees? Uh, through you, Your Worship. So with Public Works and our planting program, our intention is always to try to plant at a higher, re at a higher ratio than what they're being removed, trying to recognize that we are trying to maintain and enhance the overall canopy in the city. And, and as the uh, canopy report assessment uh, illustrated last year, um, over the last 10 years, we've been very successful with that program since the canopy hasn't, uh, hasn't changed uh, very much whatsoever in, uh, over a 10 year uh, period, which when you consider the context of the emerald ash borer devastation is pretty significant. Significant, so I think we're on the right track to continue to uh, grow the canopy now, particularly as the ash borer impact is starting to wind down. I think we'll see some uh, more positive growth on on that, and our tree planting program, of course, is we are ramping up more in the last couple of years and continue and plan on continuing to do that. Okay, thank you. One last question: um, Is there any way we could maybe remove the north? west corner of, of that lot, that area of that lot where we're saving those 300 plus trees from this eventual sale of that lot? Mr. Forrest? Uh, through you, um, I, I guess technically, yes, we, we could do that. Um, it would have a great difference and it might be make the land less appealable, uh, or less appealing, sorry, but uh, anything is technically doable. Thank you. Okay, anybody else <coughs> on clause two? Okay, so with that, we will call the vote then uh, on clause two. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried by a vote of uh, 10 to two. Councillor Stephen and Masanic opposed. Okay, uh, so now we'll move on to report number 32 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Shave, seconded by Councillor Ridge, the report number 32 from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. Okay, so the first clause, a renewal of the service level agreement between the City of Kingston and the Kingston Arts Council and Council participation in the 2023 City of Kingston Arts Fund jury. So you'll see that in this recommendation, we uh, are looking for two volunteers, two councillors, one to be a volunteer for the operating grants jury and the other for the project grants jury. Uh, are there any volunteers from council to participate? Councilor Ridge, as uh, the first volunteer, your first pick, was it the uh, operating grants or project grants? Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and through you, the projects grants. Project grants. Okay, do I have a volunteer for the operating grants? Uh, Councilor Shaves? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, if there are no other um, uh, Councillors that are interested in putting their name forward, then we will confirm Clause 1 with Councillor Ridge on the uh, Project Grants Jury and Councillor Shaves on the Operating Grants Jury. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, Clause 2, Canadian Forces-based Kingston Sports Dome Aquatics and Arena Partnership Provision of Service Agreement. Uh, Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I just want to do uh, thanks staff and uh, and obviously the base commander and everybody that worked on this uh, for bringing this forward. I think this is uh, definitely uh, an amazing path forward and a great opportunity uh, for the not just the East End, but for the entire city. Um, as we heard earlier, this uh, this agreement exists in other places, and so I think this is something I'm hoping this is going to pass unanimously. I don't see it being controversial, uh, and this is one of those ways that we can um, 
basically help share services. Uh, I know when uh, campaigning, you, you knock on the doors of people and they go, geez, you know, the, the, the provincial government through schools has all these services and, the, and then the municipal government has all these services. And then, you know, there's the base with all these services and there seems to be a lot of duplication of effort here. So if we can uh, have these agreements going forward and uh, and basically share some of those services, and, and fill in some of these needs in our community. I think it brings us closer together as a community. Uh, I think it's something that benefits everybody. So um, I'm hopeful we see more of these in the future. So great initiative by everybody involved and let's hope it passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, thank you. If there's nobody else that wishes to speak, we call the vote. All those in favor, opposed, and that's carried. Uh, clause three, rapid housing initiative round three proposed projects. Councilor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Um, question to staff, and I know I had some back and forth emails um, with Director Nordegraf, and my concern or my question, I guess, um, to staff is still, I've read the report a couple of times, and I know that the federal government, when they, when they are releasing this money to the city, there are fairly solid strings attached to it uh, in what, uh, what the expectations are. Nowhere in that report and nowhere that I see in the staff report anything about uh, seniors. And in my, in my conversations with Home Base Housing, who is one of our shelter providers, they are seeing a alarming uptick in uh, seniors accessing shelter services. Um, so the shelter system, as we know, is already serving a vulnerable population and then you add uh, seniors into that element and you're really amping up that uh, that concern or that uh, vulnerability and is can the staff walk me through the intentions of the the tiny homes I know that two are access are, are geared for accessibility out of the eight um, but what are the full intentions of that I'm, I'm I I'm trying to be as honest as I can here. I'm very concerned for our, our vulnerable seniors and not having any housing in general. Ms. Nordograph. Thank you, and through you, uh, Mayor Patterson, and thanks for that question. Um, uh, I think we would all agree with your, your concerns that um, there is a need for a wide variety of, of housing solutions, including uh, lower-income seniors. Um, we, uh, we have been and continue to work with Habitat uh, for Humanity, who will be operating uh, these eight units. Um, and to your point as well, there are two funding uh, kind of uh, commitments. One is the rapid housing um, contribution, which does have very specific expectations, does not have specific expectations around seniors. Um, but we also have a municipal contribution, which also will come with a municipal agreement, which we also allows us to identify specific expectations for the project. Um, I will say to your point, there are eight units. Two of those are accessible. Uh, the size of the units is, is fairly small. Uh, and we do uh, have conversations with Habitat for Humanity. They are actually very... Uh, uh, interested to specifically also allocate units for the senior population for the same reasons as you have just identified. So we do have an ability to not only have the conversations and intentions, but we can also actually um, hold our partner accountable for those expectations. Uh, in addition to obviously seniors, we also have through the rapid housing agreements, uh, the expectation to deliver specific units for women. Uh, so we, we are very confident with those two different uh, tools, I guess, to, to uh, still deliver for different populations, including low-income seniors. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Uh, my question is to staff with regards to the Habitat for Humanity Kingston Limestone Region on Macaulay Street. The... Um, the initiative that's going there for eight affordable housing units. Uh, that area of town and of my district is also has a high concentration of social housing, rentered income housing. I know that we are instituting the Rideau Heights regeneration strategy. Uh, my question for staff is with the amount of resources that we are pulling in to revitalize that area, um, can you perhaps speak for the public about some concerns that they may have about 
concentrating for their social housing and high needs housing in that region of the district and of the city. Mr. Ortograf. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor Pattinson. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, so we, we are working really, uh, we have been working on the Vito Heights uh, revitalization and regeneration for uh, quite a few years now. Back in 2016, uh, a revitalization plan was uh, approved by council. Uh, and I think it will be important to note that there's been a lot of investments in the, in the community already, uh, ranging from a new community center to uh, you know, the park uh, revitalization. Obviously the intent is to really diversify the housing stock in the neighborhoods. Um, obviously that means we have a high concentration of the social housing units in the neighborhood, which uh, gradually we are working on, on um, uh, uh, um, diversifying that, that stock. Uh, actually last, uh, I think it was, believe it was last council meeting, we approved or council approved the sale of 33 Compton Street for, uh, on, the, on the open market, which also really with the intent to bring in more market housing into, into the neighborhood. Um, the Habitat for Humanity project does add eight um, uh, units into the community that um, are very closely um, uh, located to the community center and will benefit from some of the services there as well. There is a second um, kind of parcel on that same block uh, that also will be coming back to council with a proposal for, again, a, a mixed market or a, a market housing development. So we are working really hard with uh, partners uh, and also the community uh, has been and will continue to be engaged in the process moving forward. I hope that is a bit of an overview of the, the process so far. Thank you. And a follow-up question, could you just perhaps speak to what the work of Habitat for Humanity does and more broadly, like what they have done in Kingston or in the area? I think that would alleviate some of the concerns I've received. Thank you, and through you, Mayor Patterson. I will be honest, I think Habitat will be better equipped to, exp to really talk about who they are and what they do, but in a nutshell, they, um, um, they are an organization that has been working with the city and in Kingston on um, some, some projects that are typically like lower income home ownership focused. So it allows the, uh, the ultimate kind of um, home owner to work on kind of the, a stat, like the creation of the, of the units with Habitat for Humanity. Obviously it's in, income based, so it really helps uh, clients to kind of get to that home ownership. This project will be uh, um, uh, actually a new type of initiatives that will focus as well on kind of a rental market. But Habitat for Humanity is a very kind of, uh, obviously an, an agency that has many branches in different cities across the world and is really kind of part of some very uh, nice, unique housing solutions. In Kingston, we have two projects. I'm sure CEO Hurdle can add to that if I'm missing one, but we have one actually uh, in the, um, uh, I'm going to say, is it uh, Cowdy Street, um, where we had a small infill location with a few townhouses that Habitat was part of. And there's also a project in the East End that Habitat has, has worked on with the city. So we do have a good relationship and continue to really work together on some, uh, I would say, some exciting new housing innovations. Thank you. Okay, we'll call the vote on Clause 3. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Clause four, sleeping cabins, seasonal transition plan. Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Um, I hope that we are all in support of this move. Uh, I know I look forward to welcoming the sleeping cabin residents back to Center 70. Um, in addition to the support uh, that I've heard from the adjacent Lakeside Community Garden, uh, there's a new nonprofit opening in Center 70 at the Canteen. It's called Bloom Skills Center, and they're opening their community cafe. Actually, the grand opening is tomorrow. Um, and they have a program that is going to be supporting skills training for young adults with different kinds of exceptionalities. Uh, their executive director has expressed support for the sleeping cabin residents, so I expect we're going to see a really successful partnership um, that happening this spring and this summer. Uh, of course, you know, while we welcome them back, we do certainly hope that a permanent location is found in the next year so that this isn't happening again. So hopefully for the last time, uh, we, we invite them back into our district. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Amos. 
Thank you, Mayor Patterson. I have an amendment I'd like to uh, bring forward. Okay, can we get that up on the screen, please? Okay, um, so we have a motion to amend, moved by Councillor Amos, seconded by Councillor Bohm. That clause four, report number 32 from the CAO be amended by adding the following two clauses following the third clause. That council direct staff to no longer investigate Rodden Park and Rideau Marina as potential long-term sites for sleeping cabins due to negative feedback received over the last six months. And that council direct staff to support our livable solutions in identifying potential long-term sites and to support OLS with the public engagement for the operations of their sleeping cabins program. Okay, so just to be clear, so once we have an motion to amend, then the discussion is only respect to those two clauses. We will return at some point to the main clause, at which time we can talk about the sleeping cabins in general. Uh, Councillor Amos, uh, it is your motion to amend. You have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Uh, I'll make this very brief and quick. Uh, I've had a, a number of discussions um, over the, my short tenure here in regards to the sleeping cabin program. It is a fantastic program that is working and, and well utilized and, and, and a big thank you to Crystal uh, Wilson and her staff of what, the, of what, they're, what they're doing and achieving. Um, way before this program was, it was still in its infancy stage. Uh, staff were tasked to potentially find more permanent locations. Uh, one was Rodden and one was the East Marina. Um, Rodden Park is not an appropriate site. It is well utilized by others. And, and as Ms. Wilson has indicated, they are like a space that is not well utilized, um, not uh, with heavy traffic and, and, and so forth. So Rodden Park is not the ideal location for that. Um, and the, it comes back to amenities as well. They're just, there's not uh, enough in and around that area as well as the East Marina. So uh, I'm asking that staff more put a, a concerted effort to find a more permanent location. I fully agree with Councillor Stephen that uh, it, it's time to find a location that they can call an actual home. Um, moving the cabins back and forth is uh, hard on the residents, it's hard on the staff, and uh, Portsmouth District has thoroughly enjoyed the process of having them there. I've had a number of positive comments um, in and around that area. So it's, it's the, the program works well, it's now trying to find that permanent location for them. Okay, discussion on the motion to amend. Uh, Councillor Glenn. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so could staff clarify what kind of uh, consultation they undertook and whether there was any education provided to the community beforehand? Because I'm just curious about this, the negative feedback and what that looked like. Ms. Nordograph. Uh, through you, Mayor Pedersen, I can start and, and um, my colleagues can add to it if I'm missing something. So back in uh, the summer of 2022, um, uh, we did receive the direction from council to go and engage with the community regarding both the Vito Marina and Rodden Park areas. Uh, we worked on a Get Involved page that received uh, a significant amount of, of comments, uh, ranging from supportive and not supportive and, and, and in between. Uh, so uh, we also obviously were embarking on um, uh, the municipal elections. So uh, while we also had to kind of review and visit, revisit the many different comments and needed to do some work to understand kind of some of the, t the nuances of those two locations, we paused the engagement at that point. Um, back in uh, February, we uh, did two engagement sessions uh, with uh, for the community, one virtual session and one in-person session um, the virtual session, sorry, I don't have the number here, uh, but actually uh, had about, I would believe about 50 to 60 participants. It was very well received and fairly positive. Uh, the in-person um, session had about, had a lower number of participants, about, I think, I believe three. Um, but overall, those, those engagements, sorry, education sessions were specifically around a broader kind of concept of sleeping cabins, obviously not specific around any location. Um, so uh, I think, believe Sierra Hurdle has has a few other things to add to that. Sierra Hurdle, thank you, and through Mr. Mayor. So um, outside of the um, more structured engagement uh, from a staff perspective, we did receive unsolicited emails. 
Um, and, and I would say the majority by far were quite negative in terms of feedback for, for both of these locations. Um, but I'm sure that um, what is referenced in the amendment is also probably feedback received by the two councillors of these uh, particular districts. And so just to follow up on the other part of my question, so has any education been provided to the general public on the sleeping cabins and what that looks like and sort of what can be expected in the community? Mr. Graff? Uh, through you, Mayor Patterson. So yes, in addition to the two sessions that, this, that uh, our livable solution organized with some support from city staff. Um, OLS has also continued to do a, a lot of engagement uh, uh, around the sleeping cabin concept. So I would argue, yes, there has been ongoing dialogue and education around the concept uh, in the community uh, in various ways. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so is there going to be a great deal of difficulty in looking into other locations? Um, I mean, we just had issues with locations for soil. Um, I know we're running out of space in the city for a lot of things. So uh, do we have other potential locations? See you, Hurdle. Thank you, and through Mr. Mayor. So we, we had presented to council back in, in the summer I think of last year around the summer, um, a number of different properties that uh, city staff had reviewed. They were city owned properties except for the Rideau Marina because we were approached by the property owner for that one. Uh, we went through a complete assessment including cost estimates for each location. Those were the two that were uh, recommended for engagement um, to be uh, undertaken. Will it be challenging? Of of course, I think finding sites for anything in the city is challenging. And to be frank, um, I think there's automatic opposition when the city is looking for sites that will serve vulnerable population, regardless of where they may be located. So there's no question that, um, that it will be a challenge ultimately wherever we can find um, sites, but that doesn't mean we can't continue to look and bring options back to council. Uh, okay, next on my list is uh, Councilor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Uh, first, a question to staff. Uh, what would be the implications of this amendment passing on the sleeping cabins and their future? Say your hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So we we definitely, as per the report, are recommending that uh, they be located at Center 70 this summer and possibly back at uh, Portsmouth Olympic Harbor uh, for next winter. We understand that this is not ideal at all. We, we understand that, that the relocation does create, obviously, a, an impact for residents. Having said that, is it feasible? The answer is yes. Does it you know, prevent us from continuing to support the sleeping cabin? I, I don't think that's the case, but it definitely would mean probably an additional relocation before we can find maybe a more appropriate site um, that could be uh, utilized for, uh, for this purpose. Thank you, uh, and just, I'm. With all due respect to my friends, Councillor Bowman, Councillor Amos, I can't in good conscience having just accepted having additional rent gear to income as, as a tiny homes in Rideau Heights, uh, supporting this amendment. I think once at, we as councillors say, not here, not here, not here, um, we're giving into the worst nature of ours. No, uh, I, I just can't in good conscience support this. So uh, I would encourage my fellow councillors to vote this down. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Councilor Chase. Thank you. Um, a question for staff, if I may. What were the initial reactions uh, for both the current locations, the Olympic Harbor and Center 70? And if you also have, what were the reactions after they were actually utilized? Ms. Nordograph. 
Uh, through you, Mayor Patterson, um, I think any new project, um, and, and we've experienced that with the sleeping cabins, both uh, initially at the Portsmouth Olympic Harbor and then the second time at Centre 70, um, we, we as staff and as OLS, um, um, there were definitely a lot of questions around, um, you know, the logistics, the clients, the, uh, the services. Um, uh, there were some, some questions around impact on the neighbourhoods. Um, I, I would argue that, and, and again, I think uh, through kind of ongoing dialogue and, and connections um, in, at both locations, and I think we also have heard that from, from some of the um, um, uh, delegations, um, there has been, um, let's say the neighborhood has overall um, um, received the cabins um, fairly positive. Um, so I, th I think what I would say, and kind of maybe similar to CEO's, CEO Hurdle's earlier comments, I think there is there are always a lot of questions around uh, a new project, a new initiatives. And again, like also uh, uh, quite often when there is a specific population or demographic, um, every project will come with its challenges in any neighborhood. So there's definitely some, some things that are uh, some kinks and some things to work out. But overall, I would say for both locations, the neighborhood has been um, accustomed to the project. Okay, thank you. And I, I think that's true to almost everything. No one likes change. And the unforeseen makes people scared and challenging to, 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 to change. So I don't think we're, this is the proper time to maybe remove these two sites off the plan. Maybe we should vote on it when it comes down to that time. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Councillor Amos um, for, for working uh, together in this. Uh, I think one of the things that, that definitely came up uh, through the community feedback, uh, especially for the Rito Marina, was uh, it's just not the right location. Uh, Transit-wise, not very accessible. The amount of services over here are very remote. It's a it's also, uh, there's a lot more history to that site than I think a lot of people appreciate. It's it's a very controversial site for the community over here, especially the residents in uh, Point St. Mark, because there were previous applications for development there, um, and they were basically ruled out of order due to the uh, heritage waterway that it resides on, the property that we're talking about here. And so... Part of the uh, the approach there um, from the applicant uh, was to basically provide some money to the city to help defer some of these costs, which, you know, you, you want to just believe that everything's done, you know, on, on the up and up. But the, the perception amongst the community was that it was a form of payback or kind of ha, gotcha, um, if the if it that it was only provided if it was located at that site so going door to door during the election uh, heard a lot of consternation a lot of frustration about that it it may not have been intended this way but it definitely came off as disingenuous to the entire site um for the entire community over here so i think that alone created such a negative atmosphere that it would never really give the sleeping cabins even even a chance and, and unfortunately, even if as successful as they are in other areas, it would really tarnish all the great work um, that has been done by uh, Crystal and her team. So there, there's there's sort of a double-edged sword here is that, you know, it, the community now, because of pre-existing issues on that site, there's a lack of trust. Uh, they felt like there was a lack of transparency. There's a lack of amenities. There's just so many things rolling against it that my biggest fear is that it would do a disservice to the entire program to try to put it in there because the entire community is, is so against it because of that history sort of of transgressions that that passed through previous developments and everything like that. So with that feeling in the community, I couldn't in good conscience say like keep keep looking at that area because I feel like the city's wasting their time. And I feel like even if it was chosen, you now have a, a community that is entirely resistant to it uh, and has a pre-bias and they're never going to give it a chance. Um, simply because of all the the history around that site. So that's one of those reasons that I hope people can support uh, removing the Rito Marina from, from this. And I'd also like to quickly ask um, a CAO Hurdle, is there anywhere in the center of the city or relative center of the city 
that is well serviced on a main transit route has access to any other amenities uh, or all the amenities that we'd look for here whether city owned or not that we could consider like is there is there any kind of like somewhat sort of secluded area but that's also in the heart of the city a, a, a kind of like an ideal site whether we own it or not that we could potentially work towards CEO hurdle Thank you, and uh, through Mr. Mayor. So we had previously looked at a property that is uh, fairly centrally located in the city. Um, the, the issue, obviously, is that the city doesn't own this property, and when we approached the property owner at that time, the property owner was not interested in the potential of a partnership. Um, now, I recognize that that was in the earlier days of the project, and, um, and it's something that we could revisit at, uh, at this time. Okay, is there something that council could do to help support that? Because it, it, like, it seems like it's potentially one of the more ideal uh, you know, situate or, uh, sites that we could uh, situate this at but it seems there's a little bit of a barrier there. So is there anything council can do or the community as a whole to try to, I guess, help move that process along for that site? So your hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I think, uh, Councillor Bohm, uh, my first step would be to reapproach the property owner. I think it would be good to start by having those conversations um, and, you know, I, I think if staff felt that council uh, support was required, we would bring something to city council to have a motion or to have some kind of recommendation move forward. Okay, thank you very much. So, yeah, so on on this amendment, I just I just want to reiterate that uh, you know probably with the best of intentions, uh, the money was offered to the city to situate them at the Rideau Marina. But unfortunately, the way that's sort of perceived um, was completely different by the community over here. So in my mind, it's just it's it's not the right place for many reasons. Um, and, you know, even if it happened to be selected, you're now going to put people in a place where, you know, they're going to like, unfortunately, the community is just not going to be welcoming. And, and I don't think that's fair to anybody when there's other places where that might not be the case. So that's kind of where this, where, where the heart of this sort of amendment is coming from is I would not in good conscience be able to support it because I don't think that you want to take a vulnerable population like that and 30, put them some, 30 seconds. Sorry, yeah. And put them somewhere where, you know, they're going to feel that animosity from the community almost through no fault of their own, simply because of the history of that site. So thank you very much. Hopefully you can support the amendment. Thank you. Councillor Ostroff. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Patterson. May, may I see the motion or the amendment again? Mm -hmm. I think I need glasses. <laughs> <laughs> this has been going on for a while, Lisa. <laughs> I've been asking her, what's it say up there? <laughs> Sorry. The, I, I guess I'm troubled. I actually really agree with Councillor Tozo uh, on this. Um, that this, this is, um, I'm, tr I'm troubled by the double paragraph here because the first one refers to uh, asking uh, um, a staff to remove it, and that's really doing the work of staff. It is, it, 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 the, those sites will, will stay or not based on their merit, not on, on, on uh, the feedback of the public. So we can't, I can't support that. I was going to ask you, Mayor Patterson, can, can that be struck off uh, as a friendly amendment? Be or, and the next question I wanted to ask was that council direct staff for our, uh, to find other sites. Uh, if I could ask staff, is that not going to happen anyways? <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I guess, the, I guess Councilor Osterhoff, Osterhoff raises a good question. The second paragraph of the amendment, is that something that is additional direction or would staff be doing that same, same work anyways if the amendment was not there? CEO Hurdle? Thank you, and uh, through Mr. Mayor. So I, I think the way that I'm reading it is that it may be putting our livable situation in more of in a leadership role in terms of identifying sites that may be more workable or operational for them rather than to have city staff trying to maybe lead that or, or figure that out. So that, that's the way that I'm reading it, but, um, and that's how we would approach it as well. 
Okay, so it's perhaps I'm 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 understanding uh, what you're saying that it, it it could and should survive. So, um, but the whole the motion uh, the amendment as it stands I can't because of the first paragraph and that that I don't think it's proper for do that. We all have our areas. We all know certain things are not suitable, but staff will arrive to those but to those decisions because they they know what they're doing and we ought not to to do that. So that's my understanding of governance. So uh, I won't be able to support the amendment unless um, in the leadership we have through Mayor Patterson, our clerks here, if that could be, if they wanted to remove it, but maybe they don't, so then it'll just be voted down and they can make a different motion. Thank you. So one thing we could do is we could vote on each of the paragraphs separately. Okay. So it's, it's fine to separate them. So we can do that. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. So if we could just see it up on the screen again. Okay, um, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Uh, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? Yeah, take the chair and uh, recognize you. Uh, so, so first, just a question on the second paragraph. Um, do staff feel that the putting OLS in a more of a leadership role and finding a site is, how do staff feel about that? Do we think that that would be a, a constructive move? Are there concerns? Can, can staff give some kind of indication to council on what they think would be a better approach? Thank you. Um, and, um, and through you, Deputy Mayor. So I think the having OLS probably being in a leadership role and also doing more of the engagement up front in terms of locations they may be interested in may be beneficial. Um, as far as education. And we've seen that, you know, with other proposals that obviously we were working on that it's sometimes better received when we have our partners work directly with the community rather than have the city try to, um, to approach the community for these types of uses. So I, I think there could be some benefits there. Obviously we would work with OLS because we understand that um, ultimately the city would have to support a relocation no matter what financially and in other ways so we would have to be uh, very involved with uh, with the sites that they're possibly identifying okay thank you so I think based on that answer um, I think I will encourage council to to support the second clause I think that there's some real value there on the first clause I share some of the concerns that have been raised well I also completely understand where Councillor Amos and Councillor Bohm are coming from. I've heard from both of those residents. I've been through Rodden Park. I've been in Point St. Mark. I understand the concerns. Um, here's, here's the issue for me. There are no other sites that are on the table right now. I have concern about removing all, all sites at this point. I think that the better option is to try to include as many new sites as possible. And then we have that discussion. And I think at that point, then we bring in the consideration and the concerns of Councillor Amos and Councillor Bohm in the neighborhood to say, okay, is there another longer term site that is viable? So again, would I then at that, at that point support this? Absolutely, but I think it's too early. I think we need to understand what the bigger picture looks like first. I will also say this, there was enormous opposition in the Portsmouth neighborhood when the sleeping cabins program was first introduced. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Yes, I think we need to be prepared that no matter what long-term site we pick, there is going to be opposition, but we have a history and I think that there's a track record there that, uh, that needs to be pointed to. So I'm gonna advocate instead for the full support of OLS and staff obviously working together to identify as many other long-term solutions and long-term sites as possible, and then we can have the discussion on which one is best. Thank you. I return the chair. Uh, thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak to the amendment? Councillor Amos, you have the last word. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Patterson. Just as final closing thoughts, um, the city is think, uh, sinking uh, uh, thousands of dollars into Rodden Park. There is a new play structure going in there. Uh, as well, the greenhouse, um, the city greenhouses are there and they are currently undergoing renovations. So the, the park is gonna be extremely busy for a very long time and that's 
uh, part of the main concern of why I brought this forward. So I'll leave that for council to consider and vote. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we will do two votes. So first we will vote on the first clause of the amendment. Again, if we could just put that up on the screen just so everyone's clear. So everyone knows. Okay, so this is the first vote on the first clause. All those in favor? Four opposed? Eight, that loses by a vote of four to eight. Councillor Amos, McLaren, uh, uh, Osanic and Bohm in the minority. Now to the second clause of the amendment. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, so we are now back to clause four as amended. Uh, is there any further discussion? Okay, we will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Clause five, affordable housing project 805 Ridley Drive, West Wing. We'll call um, Councillor Sanek, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just have one question uh, to staff. Um, I'm really happy that Don House received the 2.7 million in funding. I just wondered, um, in the fall of 2022, when they were unsuccessful, was it also for 2.7 million, or was it more money? But then, like uh, in March, we we then just received 2.7, but we had originally wanted more money. How, how did that work? Uh, Mr. Graff. <clears throat> Thank you to you, Mayor Patterson. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, we actually, as a city, applied for this funding as we were invited by the ministry to Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to put in a business case in the fall uh, that was at that point uh, not approved, uh, but we received uh, on March the 1st a letter that they actually did approve the funding. I think there was some year-end funding. So. Um, there was the same amount, the same kind of business case, and this, so it was a $2.7 million application. Thank you. So I guess we got really lucky to um, be successful after all. <laughs> $2.7 million turned down, but then we got $2.7 million back. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else on Clause 5? All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, and that's carried. Okay, under report number 33 from the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee. Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that report number 33 from the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee be received and adopted. Okay, so there are two clauses. Unless anyone wants them separated, we'll vote on them as a whole. Number one, this is 2022 Accessibility Plan Status Update. And number two, appointments to working groups. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, on to report number 34 from Committee of the Whole. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Hassan, that report number 34 from the Committee of the Whole be received and adopted. Okay, uh, sure, if, um, if the acting clerk is able to walk us through uh, the votes on this, that would be great. Okay, we will have a number of people leaving the room. I see Councillor Bohm has, has already left uh, for the first part. So the first vote will be uh, on item one, which is the operating and capital budgets for the municipally owned utilities. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, Councillor Bohm, you may return. Councillor Amos, you are excused. Okay, the next vote will be on that portion of the budget that relates to the Seniors Association uh, and Councillor Bowman, or Councillor Amos is excused for his previously declared conflict in that regard. Okay, uh, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Councillor Amos, you may return. Councillor Osterhoff, you are excused. Okay, the next vote will be for that portion of the budget that relates to the operating and capital budgets for the Kingston Access Services, again for a previously declared conflict by Councillor Osterhoff. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Councillor Osterhoff, you may return. Okay. The next vote is for all of the remaining parts of the budget, except for the bylaws, and that would be our final vote. So we have two more. Okay, 
All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. And then uh, for this vote, this final clause, Councillor Amos, Councillor Bowman, Councillor Osterhoff, you are excused once again. <laughs> okay, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, uh, so with that, we will continue. We have nothing else from Committee of the Whole. Uh, information reports. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please just raise your hand as I read through them. Uh, number one, major policy planning projects. Number two, update on committed transportation projects and studies. Number three, 2022 statement of remuneration and expenses paid to council members and other council appointees. Number four, January 2023 contract awards subject to delegation of authority. Number five, population, housing, and workforce update. Number six, community safety and well being plan, background, and status update. Okay, we have no information reports from members of council. Miscellaneous business. Uh, we have uh, several motions. Number one, moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Amos. That is requested by Nancy Galaski, GPS CIDP, Foundation of Canada City Council proclaim May 2023 to be GPS CIDP Awareness Month in the City of Kingston. Number two, moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Osanek. That is requested by Cynthia Beach, Compassionate Communities, Kingston, Canada. City Council proclaim April 16th, 2023 to be National Advanced Care Planning Day in the City of Kingston. Number three, moved by Councillor Shave, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that Nathan Splinter be affirmed as the Queen's University representative on the Kingston Environmental Advisory Forum, appointed for a term ending November 14th, 2026. Number four, moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Ridge, that is requested by Krista LeClaire, Kingston Accommodation Partners, City Council proclaim March 30th as Global Meetings Industry Day in the City of Kingston. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay. We have five new motions, so uh, I would propose we will take a 10-minute break. It is 9.17. We will reconvene at 9.27.
Okay, folks, it is uh, 9.27, so I'll ask if people can grab, a, grab their seats, please. All right. <laughs> it's not, and it's Councillor Bohm's motion. This one? This first one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Councillor Bohm, we're discussing how your motion is two pages long, so I'm, I'm debating how much of this I'm going to read. <laughs> Councillor Bohm, the brief. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Um, okay, so we will um, we'll reconvene with new motions. Uh, so new motion number one is it, a highly technical motion, so I'm going to read the whereas clauses and then just the outline of the, the um, resolve clauses, and then I'll let Councillor Bohm uh, speak to it. So. Uh, new motion number one, moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Mayor Patterson. Whereas Council approved the draft plan of subdivision for 998 Highway 15 on September 20th, 2022, which contained a condition requiring the owner to design and construct a signaled intersection at Highway 15 and Street A as part of the first phase of the development. Whereas the Highway 15 Municipal Class Environmental Assessment that was paused in March 2020 had not yet evaluated the appropriate intersection design for the 998 Highway 15 subdivision, including whether a roundabout would be feasible in lieu of a signaled intersection. Whereas the city intends to restart and complete the Class EA now that the Wobbin Crossing is complete. Whereas the construction of the signal intersection at the subdivision entrance is not required until build out of the subdivision development, which is anticipated to occur after completion of the Class EA. Whereas the city's transportation services department and the owner are agreeable to the city assuming responsibility for the design and construction of the intersection improvements at Highway 15 and Street A in accordance with the recommendations of the Class EA, subject to the owner making a financial contribution equivalent to the cost of constructing the signaled intersection that was contemplated in the original conditions of draft plan approval. And whereas subsection 5144 of the Planning Act states that the approval authority may change the conditions of a draft plan of subdivision approval at any time before the approval of the final plan of subdivision, Therefore be resolved that the notice of decision of application for approval of draft plan of subdivision for 998 Highway 15 is hereby amended, uh, amended by deleting a couple of conditions, putting in a couple of other conditions, uh, so that planning services then uh, be directed to provide notice of the change of conditions in prescribed manner pursuant to subsection 5145 of the Planning Act. Councillor Bohm, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. So, to sum up that two-page motion, um, <laughs> essentially what we're trying to do here is uh, there, there is no true roundabout policy yet at the city, uh, so it's unfortunate um, that any development that comes forward right now is sort of like looked at ad hoc. Um, this uh, essentially is, is a great location for it. Uh, we're, I'm going to bring it up as strategic planning. I know a number of other councillors are as well, that uh, roundabouts are just quite honestly, the way of the future, um, you know, we, we can keep going around about them or we can start building them. So essentially what this motion does is uh, it, uh, I reached out to the to the developer. I, I worked with uh, senior, city, city, senior city staff, uh, Commissioner Joyce and, and his team there. And we came up with a way to uh, really go back and, and reevaluate uh, a roundabout at that location. Um, and all parties are on board. And basically what this motion does in the grand scheme of things in a very wordy, very wordy way, um, is allows us to go back and do that. So, um, you know, we can uh, we can set a precedent here and uh, show that they can they can work in some great spots, and then uh, that can help draft our policy. And sometimes, you know, you just gotta put that impetus out there. And uh, in this case, um, you know, I felt like we've been going around enough, and uh, so let's throw some roundabouts in. So, uh, thanks, senior city staff, uh, Commissioner Joyce, especially for his uh, his help on this, and uh, hope everybody can support this. Okay, thank you, Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Well, we can go in circles all night about this motion and go round and round the horseshoe again and again and sort of hop on and hop off and pivot to the right of the political spectrum and the left of the political spectrum on this, or we can just sort of loop around and answer the questions. I'm, thank you, and thank you for the, uh, the motion, Councillor Bohm. Uh, a question I have for staff, and I don't know how to say this, but I'm just gonna say it. Is this a good idea? Uh, Councilor, uh, Commissioner Joyce. <laughs> Thank you, and through you, Your Worship, yes. <laughs> no further questions here. Anybody else? Councilor Glenn. Uh, thank you, and through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So not to be outdone, 
I'm not going to beat around the traffic circle. I'm going to vote for this. Anybody else have some great roundabout puns that they're just <laughs> dying to throw out there? Deputy Mayor Chinani? No, I don't have a pun, but um, my comment is uh, I think it's a really great idea. Um, and I like that there's a lot of opportunity for greening the center of a roundabout that um, I think environmentally, um, traffic wise, you'd be emitting less. And also, there's an opportunity of greening the center for uh, environmental reasons, too. So. Okay, uh, Councillor Sun. Thank you, Worship, and through you. Is that uh, building a roundabout cheaper than putting a traffic light? Commissioner Joyce? Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. So the capital costs, uh, generally, in a very general sense, are more expensive for building a roundabout than a, a signalized intersection, depending on a, a number of factors, of course, and that can vary quite a bit. Uh, however, the, when you look at the total cost of ownership, um, the operational cost associated with a signalized uh, intersection is much higher, obviously, than it is with a roundabout. So there's savings over a longer period from an operational cost perspective, even though there's an initial capital outlay that may be more. And is that more beneficial to the um, longer, in, in, the, in the long run, than the uh, uh, having a light? Through you, Your Worship, uh, yes. Yeah, so the t when you look at the total cost of ownership, and again, it really does depend on the specific intersection, uh, because there are some cases where a signalized intersection would be probably more warranted uh, than a roundabout, and there's uh, areas where the roundabouts would be more appropriate than a signaled intersection, and the cost of ownership would play into that. Okay, next is uh, Councillor Shaves. Thank you. Um, I see you're coming full circle on this, considering I'm not sure how many of the current councillors remember we used to have a traffic circle in the middle of town, uh, Princess, Concession, Bath Road. Um, my question to staff would be, would this be an increased way of increasing traffic calming and also keeping traffic flowing? Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. Uh, so roundabouts uh, can serve traffic calming uh, purposes uh, because it does tend to slow the traffic down. You have to yield to traffic that's in the roundabout, of course. Uh, so there are uh, some positive aspects to it. Um, Pedestrianization can sometimes be good and sometimes be uh, not so good. Again, it depends on the circumstances. Uh, and in terms of traffic flow, again, it, it depends. In this situation, we believe it will improve traffic flow. Okay. Yeah, uh, you touched on the issue of pedestrianization with uh, roundabouts, which I have a couple of those in my area, my district, which we'll have to address. Um, are we aware as, as to why we got rid of our initial traffic circle? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I was just wondering, is, are we aware of why we got rid of our initial traffic circle midtown? That, that was a long time ago, Mr. Yeah. Joyce. I'm not sure if you, I'm not I'm sure sorry, if you were around. I don't know that. <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure if it was due to accidents or just because it was not trendy anymore. So, But I guess we're just coming full circle, as I mentioned. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Um, as most of you know, I'm a, a, a papa or a grandfather, and uh, it's, it's a common practice when my grandson visits me from Ottawa that, uh, or I visit him that he gets to go in the car uh, and enjoy a roundabout experience with Papa Don. So uh, that alone, uh, I'll be voting for this just so that he can go we uh, as we go about roundabouts. Okay, anybody else who wishes to speak? 
Okay, we will call the vote on clause one. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, on to new motion number two. I will uh, hand the chair over to the deputy mayor. So motion number two, moved by Mayor Patterson and seconded by Councillor Glenn. Whereas the homeless crisis is taking a devastating toll on our families and communities, undermining a healthy and prosperous Ontario. And whereas the homeless, homelessness crisis is the result of the underinvestment of and poor policy choices of successive provincial governments. And whereas the city of Kingston recently declared a mental health and addictions crisis, asking the province to intervene with investment and coordinated resources. And whereas the city of Kings, or the city has not had a response to our declaration and AMO is launching an advocacy, advocacy campaign to get municipalities to pass local motions to ask the province to a coordinated funded approach. And whereas homelessness requires a range of housing, social services and health solutions from government beyond the scope of municipal governments. And whereas homelessness is felt most at the level of local government and the residents that they serve, and whereas municipalities are doing their part, but do not have the resources, capacity, and tools to address the complexity of health care people need. And whereas leadership and urgent action is needed from the provincial government on an emergency basis to develop resource and implement a comprehensive plan to prevent, reduce, and ultimately end homelessness in Ontario. Therefore, be it resolved that the city of Kingston calls on the provincial government to urgently a, acknowledge that homelessness in Ontario is a social, economic, and health crisis. Commit to ending homelessness in Ontario. Work with AMO and a, and a broad range of community health, indigenous, and economic partners to develop resource and implement a, an action plan to achieve this goal. And that a copy of this motion be sent to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, the Minister of Health, and to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. So, I guess, is there any discussion? Or, actually, you have uh, the floor to, for your motion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. So, I'm sure everyone's aware that the provincial budget is going to be released this Thursday. In the lead up to that, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario has been driving an advocacy campaign to try to get as many municipalities as possible to speak out on the housing and homelessness issue, which, by the way, is the number one budget ask from AMO, which is great. So I think it's important for everyone around this table to understand we are not alone in our call out to the province about the need for funding supports on this issue. Every other community, every other mayor that I talk to across the community is saying exactly the same thing. So this is really, I know we've already passed motion, you know, specific to Kingston declaring, uh, an addiction and mental health crisis. This is about one more step for us to add our voice. And um, I shared with you earlier today that there was an open letter to the Premier that was, that's was that been put in a number of different media outlets across the province. And the calls to action are exactly the same as what's in this motion. So essentially this is just one more strike in advance of the provincial budget on, when, on Thursday. And obviously we're hoping for significant investment in this area. So we'll see what happens. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Tozo. Thank you, your Dep Deputy Worship, through you. Um, I obviously support this motion. Um, I think a question, and I'm going to vent a bit of frustration and just a genuine answer. Um, we've done motions like this. I know other municipalities have. I've seen AMO do their work on social media platforms. Do you have any sense that this government is listening to any of these things? I know you've been working on this file for a very long period of time. With all of the collective voices of municipalities, like, we keep waiting for something, and I don't, are we gonna be, in your mind, does this type of advocacy work, and is this the only tool in our toolbox? So it's a great question, Councillor Tozo. I think that the key is to build as many alliances as possible. And I think it's important to know that, um, for example, the open letter that talks about this particular issue 
isn't even just from municipalities, it's from a number of other provincial associations, so business associations, social service associations, there's a very broad coalition of, I think, about 25 different groups that are joining with us on this issue. So I think that we um, are really doing everything we can to, uh, to give voice to this issue. I am hopeful that the province is listening to us, but we will find out on Thursday. Thank you. Councillor Glenn. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I have a feeling that we're not going to have any trouble passing this motion, but just to speak uh, to Councillor Toza's question, um, the reality we know in politics is that the more voices, the louder the voices, um, that's usually what moves things forward. And I think finally we've reached a groundswell that is large enough that we might see some action. Um, am I sitting here holding my breath? Uh, yes, because I don't know what the outcome of this is going to be, but anything less than putting forward our best effort um, would be uh, you know, a sad commentary on us as a city. So I think this is what we can do. This is what we can continue to press forward with. Um, you know, if this provincial government decides not to move forward and provide the assistance that the municipalities need so much, I hope that the voters of Ontario are paying attention to that as they go towards the next election. So I'm uh, very glad that we're seeing this. I'm very glad that AMO has made this their number one issue. Um, it's very difficult to address any of the other issues of the day when we have people who don't have homes to live in. So we talk about the environment here at the table, we talk about roads, we talk about all of that, but the reality is we have people who simply um, don't have a place to be and they're not getting the care they need to have a home. So um, I'm trusting that all, all of council is going to support this motion and let's uh, keep our fingers crossed that it has some impact. Hey, is there anyone else? So, Mayor, you have the final word? No? All right, so we can bring it to a vote. All in favor? Opposed? None? Passes unanimously, and I return the chair. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. On to new motion number three, moved by Councillor Glenn, uh, seconded by Councillor McLaren. Whereas the municipalities of Guelph, Windsor, the entire Greater Toronto Area, Belleville, Hamilton, London and Ottawa, among others, provide time-limited free parking for vehicles with accessible parking passes. Whereas the City of Kingston aims to be barrier-free for persons with disabilities. Whereas parking fees often pose an additional barrier to persons with disabilities' participation in society. Therefore, be it resolved that staff report to the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee with recommendations for time-limited free parking for vehicles with accessibility passes to align with other municipalities in Ontario and a review of parking fines for vehicles parked illegally in accessible parking spaces by the end of Q2 2023. Councillor Glenn, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, at the heart of this motion, I think, is, is the recognition that um, we could be doing better to support another vulnerable population in our city. I was actually quite surprised to hear that we didn't already do this, knowing that this was going on in the greater Toronto area and being well accustomed to it, having been there for quite some time. Um, the reality for individuals uh, with disabilities, I think, is that oftentimes, unfortunately, economically, they're also struggling. Um, this is to address Part of that issue to allow them to participate more fully and to remove another systemic barrier. Um, you know, if you've got mobility issues and you have to drive somewhere um, and park, uh, if you can't park somewhere easily and reasonably and not have to um, afford that extra cost, um, you know, it, it changes your life. Um, we already know that persons on ODSP are struggling. I mean, they we see the impact that. Uh, it has on their ability to find homes. Um, even with the increases that have been allotted, uh, the free money that's there and available for things like parking simply doesn't exist in that kind of a budget. So this is to address that. I think as a city, um, it's one of the small things that we can do again to allow for full participation, to allow people the mobility and the access um, about the city that they need. Um, so I'm hoping that you'll support this motion. Councillor Stephen. 
Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Uh, just a quick question about this motion. Um, it mentions recommendations for time-limited free parking, and I just was wondering, what does time-limited mean in this sense? Uh, so, um, I'll go to uh, Mr. Smith, and then I'll allow the mover if you want to add anything. Uh, Mr. Smith. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, there's been the concept and, and what we try to do in, in general in, in parking matters is to make sure that there is a certain level of, of rotation of movement through spaces. So that's one of the reasons why we do put time limits on the parking. So for instance, in, in this case, it could be that uh, it would be a maximum time of three hours that could be on that parking space just to ensure that other people with, with accessibility permits who want to make use of those accessible spaces can get in there. Thank you, Mr. Smith. So I won't go any further into this um, because Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee will, correct? Uh, Mr. Smith? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else? Uh, Councilor Ostroff. Sorry, sorry. I, I'm, I'm intending to s support the motion. Um, Though I know I've had, I, the question I have is that how it's written uh, concerns me a little bit because it, does it preclude that there's going to be, a, we still have an opportunity of council to debate, right? When it, is it going to be presented by municipal advisory, uh, accessibility advisory committee? Because it, it says there be, be a result that staff report to uh, municipal advisory committee with recommendations for time limited free parking but it doesn't ask for for will there be a recommendation from the committee to support this so Councilor Stoff, I suppose it depends what the committee decides to do with the information uh, and the recommendation from staff I would expect that if a recommendation came from municipal accessibility advisory committee that would then come to council for discussion a am I correct madam acting clerk on that Yes, Mayor Patterson, you're correct. Okay. So thank you. Just to, so then, because I my point is that um, we already know from past discussions and last term, I think this came up, and and we know that it will cost hundreds of thousands of dollars of tax uh, of of money that uh, is collected by parking, and and um, I'm not exactly sure if uh, parking, we need to determine do parking fees actually pose a barrier to persons. I mean, I'm speaking with, a, and I have a child with a disability, so I'm not speaking of someone who doesn't understand. I do. Um, and, but I think that um, it's okay to pay a parking ticket, uh, parking uh, as well. It is okay to do that. That's part of society and, and our responsibilities. So um, I'm just wondering uh, about this. Uh, and uh, I think it's okay to compare with other municipalities and then we get a decision to make later because I actually had people call me on this saying it's okay for us to pay. So that's another way to look at it. So I'm not sure, uh, I'm happy for the study on it and I'm happy for the deliberation uh, at another time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, Councilor Glenn, unless there's anything else you wanted to add? Um, just actually, I'm going to ask um, for a bit of clarification with regards to costs. So um, approximately, uh, so, Mr. Smith, approximately how much would this cost us as a city to provide this? Mr. Smith. Thank you, and for you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, revenues for last year for 2022, as, as we're just coming back, rebounding from, uh, from the pandemic, we're in the realm of approximately $61,000 that we've attributed to accessible parking spaces. 32,000 of that is for actual on-street uh, spaces that are designated as, as accessible spaces. And then we're, we're done a little bit of uh, review and analysis and we anticipate somewhere around 30,000 can be attributed to spots in lots and garages. So grand total of $61,000, $62,000 last year. Okay, and just as a follow-up to that, so one of the other things, um, our fines are lower than other cities as well, 
And so there would be consideration potentially for increasing fines for parking uh, inappropriately in um, an accessible spot. Uh, and what's the difference between our rates and those of other cities? Thank you, and through you again, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, so the, the province uh, a number of years ago did set a minimum on uh, parking, uh, a parking fine for parking in an accessible space inappropriately at $300. A number of municipalities have in the subsequent years uh, raised that. There are some that are at 350, some at 450, and I believe several top out at $500 for improperly parking in one of these spaces. So there is room for us to review that. We are currently doing some studies on that, a jurisdictional scan, just to see where we could lie. And again, we would be coming forward to the uh, Accessibility Advisory Committee with, with some of these for discussion. And so just a final uh, question then. So given that you're bringing, you would be bringing this kind of uh, information forward, there's a possibility that um, those fines might offset some of the cost. And you don't have to have yes, a magic wand to tell me how much yet. <laughs> that is correct. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I think it's worth having a look at this um, and that's really what this motion is about, to come back with that information so we can um, hopefully give it uh, the proper um, review that it really deserves. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We will call the vote then on uh, new motion number three. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, number four, moved by Councillor Amos, seconded by Councillor Sun. Whereas there are currently no camping options for recreational vehicles within the urban boundary of the City of Kingston, whereas the City of Kingston operated a campground at Lake Ontario Park for many years until 2005, was the City of Kingston recently operated a pilot project providing camping options for active transportation at Lake Ontario Park, whereas the City of Kingston still provides event camping options for recreational vehicles at Lake Ontario Park with appropriate servicing. Therefore, be it resolved that Council directs staff to report back to Arts, Recreation, Community Policies Committee by Q2 2024 with information on options to provide seasonal camping opportunities for recreational vehicles at Lake Ontario Park. Councillor Amos, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Um, so. COVID has done a number of things um, in the camping industry, uh, mostly positive in regards to people wanting to enjoy the outdoors, people wanting to uh, do backcountry camping, and also uh, the other end of the spectrum with RV camping. Right now, Kingston has no interior, when I say interior, no camping uh, within its city limits. It's... Um, there's nowhere for RVs to go, uh, and most RVs are, uh, well, sorry, a large number of RVs are being towed by cars, so uh, they need a staging area. Uh, driving a large RV around the city, trying to enjoy what the city has to offer from restaurants to shopping experiences is not a practical way for our tourist industry to be enjoyed um, by the uh, folks that enjoy RV camping. If we're able to give them a spot uh, like Lake Ontario Park and that was utilized for a number of years leading up to uh, 2005, then there's an opportunity to have uh, further tourism come into our city um, and our restaurants, our shopping, uh, enjoy that economic uh, benefit with that. We're not talking a lot of RV spots, we're uh, probably in the neighborhood of around 22. Um, but it's something that the staff can work with and uh, find if there is a solution or an opportunity for us to walk down that economic engine to further support uh, our restaurants and further support our, uh, the shopping industry in Kingston. So uh, I think there's an opportunity here for uh, us to explore. And that's all this is, it's just asking staff to explore to see if Lake Ontario Park can support this uh, going forward and something that won't happen this year, but uh, start to be reviewed and, and thought about for 2024, potentially 2025. Um, I'll leave it at that. It's, it's, RV camping is always gonna be there. We are a, uh, our population is older than a lot of the other populations in the, in the Ontario region. We're a retirement destination. People with RVs will want to come here to check out our facility, check out our, our, uh, our city. Uh, what a great opportunity to bring them into the interior of our city, enjoy a great park uh, in their evening hours, and enjoy shopping experiences during the daylight hours. Thanks. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody on this motion? Uh, Deputy Mayor Chinani. Um, yeah, I think it's a great idea exploring. Um, my question is, um, it was a long time ago, um, so do we know why it was stopped in 2005? Was there challenges or things that arose that were obstacles or that, that made it where we couldn't, couldn't no longer um, take care of or host uh, camping or RVs there? Ms. Turner? Through you, Mayor Patterson, um, my understanding at the time, uh, Councillor, was that there was a review of municipal services and um, the campground was used at night and, and on the weekends, I think about 50% of the, the actual spots and about 25% during the weekdays. So with that review of municipal services that was brought forward to Council at the time, the decision was made at that point to close the campground piece. Okay, I see you. a hurdle. Thank you, <clears throat> and through you, I just want to add that um, there was definitely a deficit identified with the operations at the time, but it was a supervised campsite. So it was a, a fully staffed and supervised campsite, which I think is different than what um, Councillor Amos is proposing. Thank you. Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, I really like motions like this because they're just asking for a staff recommendation. And then we kind of go from there once recommendations come through and once we get analysis and, and, um, and, uh, and ideas. What are, does staff know what RVs are doing now when they visit? Like where are they located? Are they in parking lots of like Walmart or something? Or like what's their, where, do they, where are they? Ms. Turner. Through you, Mayor Patterson, uh, that's correct. Councillor Tozo, you'll see a lot of the RVs that are in town, especially for sports tourism related events, um, are in the parking lot, mostly at, at Walmart and places like that. Thank you, and a follow up, are there any other places where like, is it mainly pr facilitated, facilitated through like private property and private markets, or is that where they're mainly located? Or do we offer any public services for RVs right now? For you, Mayor Patterson, um, we do not offer any public services at this point for, for RVs, um, but so yes, they're mostly on, on private property except for maybe, you know, like a KOA campground just outside of the city. Okay. Um, no further questions. Thank you. Councillor Glenn. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm definitely supporting this motion. And uh, to Councillor Tozo's question, uh, yeah, they park in parking lots beside apartment buildings. There is one in my district, and I've had numerous complaints as I campaigned about it. So um, that would be one of the reasons I'd love to see this move forward, because there are people coming into the city uh, that don't just go to Walmart and park. They come deeper into the city, and then uh, there's garbage issues and uh, a lot of other things going on that just are, are creating problems for, for residents. So we need an appropriate spot, in my opinion, for RVs to go to. Um, and it seems to me that Lake Ontario Park would be that. So um, I'm looking forward to the recommendations coming back and hopefully seeing a, a, an appropriate spot uh, for people to enjoy camping in the city. Councilor Ostroff? Yes, I'm happy to support uh, this motion too. I think it's a, a it's a good idea and a good tourism uh, idea as well. But I just want to just clarify that we just uh, we have two excellent RV campgrounds in the rural area. They're very large and very successful, very clean. And uh, I would have to think that it would be the rarest of things that an RVer would leave garbage behind. I I don't know it. I am an RVer myself, and um, they are very responsible. So I don't. Uh, I, I've never seen it anyways, uh, but I would also think that this is uh, something that is um, a good idea and uh, it should be, be a, for, for inner city and for uh, location wise, I'd, I'd love to see it back. Thank you. Okay, anybody else on new motion for? Councillor Amos, any last words? Okay, call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, okay, on to new motion number five. Again, I'm going to ask if the deputy mayor would take the chair, please. I take the chair. Um, so, motion number five, moved by 
Mayor Patterson, seconded by Councillor Glenn, whereas the City of Kingston has acknowledged that there is an affordable housing shortage. And whereas a growing, King, a growing Kingston needs to increase its housing supply on all levels, and whereas at this moment, federal and provincial funds are abundant for nonprofit housing starts, and whereas a city and community nonprofit partnerships better facilitate access to federal and provincial funds, and whereas uh, housing co ops meet these requirements and provide many additional benefits to the community, and whereas Limestone City Cooperative Housing is an organization with the goal of providing housing to members on a cooperative basis. Therefore, be it resolved that council approves the appointment of a member of council to the board of directors of the Limestone City Cooperative Housing Incorporation, effective upon its incorporation and further approves the inclusion of such an office in the bylaws of Limestone City Cooperative Housing Incorporated and that council furthermore approves upon such incorporation of Limestone City Cooperative Housing Incorporated, the appointment of Councillor Jeff McLaren for the term of council as the initial uh, appointee to serve as municipal representative on its board of directors. Uh, you have the, uh, you can, you have the, uh, your time to speak. Uh, thank you, thank you Deputy Mayor. Uh, I think we can all agree on the affordable housing front that we need a whole bunch of different projects of all different forms, shapes, and sizes to move forward to, uh, to address this issue. One of those models that I think is demonstrated to be very effective is the co-op housing model. We have had a co-op housing uh, uh, model in Kingston for a number of years. It's been very successful, and of course, it is also in the midst of an expansion uh, right now, which is great to see. But there is also um, opportunities for more federal funding for new co-op projects. And so I'm very happy to see that a new co-op organization has formed in the community. Uh, and I know that Councilor McLaren has been very involved in those discussions and in those, uh, the planning of that new co-op organization. So I certainly want to congratulate and thank Council McLaren and others for their work in putting this organization together. And for that reason, I think it only makes sense uh, if we are going to support this organization with a council appointee, that Council McLaren would be the natural choice. Um, so I am asking council to support the motion, both uh, to support Council McLaren's appointment, but also to support this uh, new co-op organization. And certainly, uh, we're certainly hoping that they will qualify for funding, that we'll be able to get shovels in the ground and be able to see uh, a new project move forward. Thank you. Right, are there any questions? Councillor Tozo. Thank you, your Dep Deputy Worship, through you. Um, okay, so first question I have is the Limestone City Cooperative Housing Incorporated. Um, as we have a member of council sitting on the board, are we then appointing, uh, will there be other public appointments from nominations or what is the city's relationship with this uh, if we appoint councillor? Which I, I support this motion, Jeff, don't, or Councillor McLaren, don't look at me like that. Um, I'm just curious about our relationship with this uh, co-op. Thank you, this is a community-led co-op. It's mm -hmm. led by, um, it'll be a board of five. Um, they haven't given me authority to, re replay or to say who they are, but I can tell you that um, we have an advocate uh, for housing. We have somebody with um, lived experience in poverty and in homelessness. I hope to be one of them as well. We also have, uh, who has given permission, uh, Councillor Emeritus Rob Hutchison, who actually ran a co-op. Um, these are the community members. We're gonna be looking for more members going forward. And the point is that it is run by the community. In fact, um, we have one dedicated staff person. Her name is Ashley Perna. Um, I'm funding this and she comes with 15 years of law clerk experience and is working for her, um, for her uh, paralegal license. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has put in a ton of administrative work on this and wouldn't be at this stage without her. And um, she will be helping the board with uh, the paperwork and that, but it will be entirely run by the community. Okay. So for clarification, there wouldn't be any nominations or would, we wouldn't have to appoint people as a city to the board as well. It would just be yourself. Is that correct? Yes. And the reason for that is um, having consulted with legal staff, the integrity commissioner and an outside lawyer, it became the best way to um, <laughs> facilitate 
the interaction between the community and staff. I have a certain amount of experience working in city politics and uh, with mm. city staff that may not be available in the community. And as a community member, part of this board, it links the two. Yeah. I admire your diligence, Councillor McLaren, about ensuring uh, any conflict of interest. I think that does make, maintain that. Does this change the nature of our relationship as a city with the limestone city cooperative housing? Or is it just we have a public, we have a councillor sitting on it, we're appointing it. Um, I, I'm curious about that relationship. The relationship allows me to talk to you oh, about yeah. uh, funding, strategy, planning, and stuff like that without there being a conflict. The, uh, com the Municipal Act allows for council to decide that there are some issues that are of vital importance and appoint members to it. Um, so for example, the police. We appoint a member to public health. We appoint members to uh, the library board. Um, if these members ever talk to any of us without the council, endorsement, uh, it would be a conflict of interest. So this is the way to overcome that hurdle. Okay. And again, maybe this is a question for a solicitor, and I just want to clarify this because I want to know what role we as councillors can have being appointed to boards. This is more a question in general and not to this specific case. What is our advocacy role when we're appointed to certain boards? Like what's that relationship then? Do we have to declare conflict of interest? I'm curious about this relationship because it's not clear to me. Uh, thank you, through your worship. Um, this is more of a question for the Integrity Commissioner in terms of conflicts of interest because I can't advise individual members of council on that regard. Mm -hmm. However, I can speak to the fact that you do have a fiduciary obligation as a member of council to represent uh, the interests of the city. You will also have a, at times, competing obligation as a member of the board of a, a specific organization. It would be incumbent on each of you in those dual roles to determine if you have a conflict in any specific situation. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Councillor McLaren, for your uh, vociferous uh, advocacy for cooperative housing, and good luck to you. We need it. We need as much of this as we can get. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Glenn? Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. And not a question so much as just um, a comment that, you know, we've we've been talking about how dismal the housing situation is, and tonight, I think there's some huge wins. We've seen um, us just pass a number of um, rapid housing initiatives. And as I spoke to several meetings ago, this has to be a community effort if we're going to solve this. So thank you um, for stepping up. And I think um, to everybody at the Limestone Cooperative, a thank you from us as a council. Um, I'm very glad to see that we'll be able to communicate, stay involved, and to provide support. And I think that's one of the largest roles we can provide to a cooperative is to continue to support their development and uh, other developments that might come forward. So I'm totally thrilled about this tonight. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing as none, we'll call a vote. All in favor? Opposed? It passes. I return the chair. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. So that takes us to the end of new motions. Are there any notices of motion? Okay, uh, Madam Acting Clerk, ask for minutes, please. Moved by Councillor Amos, seconded by Councillor Tozo, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 10 2023, held Tuesday, March the 7th, 2023, be confirmed. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. We have a number of communications. Is there any other business? Councillor Tozo? Thank you, Your Worship, through you. I'd just like to identify that as a member of the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee that it is World Down Syndrome Day. Um, the way that most people do uh, show this is by wearing mismatched socks. I am currently wearing two mismatched socks right now. I'm wearing uh, uh, Simpsons I Choo Choo Choose You and a Vincent Van Gogh uh, Starry Night. Uh, so I just want to uh, recognize uh, World Down Syndrome Day and advocate for its continued recognition by our, our council. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Tozo. I'm getting a good look at your socks uh, from my end. So thank you. Okay, with that, uh, I will turn it over to uh, the acting clerk to walk us through the votes on the bylaws, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Okay, first bylaw vote, moved by Councillor Boehm, seconded by Councillor Glenn, that bylaws one and nine be given their first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, Councillor Boehm, you are excused for the next six bylaw votes. Uh, vote B, moved by Councillor Hassan, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that bylaws two and four be given their first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Vote C, moved by Councillor Hassan, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that clause 12.63 of bylaw number 2021-41 be suspended for the purpose of giving bylaws two through four three readings. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Vote D, moved by Councillor Hassan, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that bylaws two through four be given their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Councillor Amos and Councillor Osterhoff, you're excused for the next three bylaw readings. So this is bylaw vote E, moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Ridge, that bylaws five and six be given their first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. A bylaw vote F, moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Ridge, that clause 12.63 of bylaw number 2021-41 be suspended for the purpose of giving bylaws five and six three readings. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Vote G, moved by Councillor Osanek, Osanek, seconded by Councillor Ridge, that bylaws five and six be given their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Councillors, you may return. And this is the final bylaw vote H, moved by Councillor Ridge, seconded by Councillor Amos, that bylaws one and seven through nine be given their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Motion to adjourn, please. Every hand went up at exactly the same time. So I'm gonna have to pick two people at random. Okay, moved by Councillor Amos, seconded by Councillor Tozo. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you very much. Have a good night.